to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Open public meetings law is enacted to ensure the rights of the public to have advance notice and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Fourth Leaf Board of Education has caused notice this meeting to be published on January 11th, 2024, and posted on the district's website at www.flboe.com. Published in the board's designated online media outlet newspapers. The record and the star ledger filed with the clerk of the borough of Fort Lee and mailed to all persons, if any, who have requested said notice. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcasted on local TV and online uh, on a future date. The Open Public Meeting Act allows for remote participation at board meetings and defines meetings at any gathering, whether for count, Corporeal, thank you. Or by means of communication equipment, which is attended by or open to all of the members of the public body held in the intent and on the part of the members of the board present to discuss or act on a unit upon the specific public business of the body. Roll call, please. Mrs. Byers Kang? Here. Ms. Kolbach? Here. Ms. Curry? Here. Mr. Knight? Here. Mrs. Kotang? Here. Mr. Lopez? Here. Ms. Morrell? Here. Mr. Rubino? Here. Mrs. Richter? Here. The board will be convening to executive sessions to discuss legal, personal, and other confidential matters. The board will reconvene into public session at approximately 7.30 p.m. May I have a motion to go into executive session? Motion. Second. So it was Ms. Curry and Byers King. Byers King. So we're now all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're now in executive session.
to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advanced meetings and to attend meetings of public bodies in which any business affecting their interests is discussed or asked. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, before the Board of Education has passed notice of this meeting to be published on January 11th, 2024, and posted on the district website at www.flboe.com, published in the board's designated online media outlet newspaper, The Record, and the Star Ledger, filed with the clerk of the borough of Fort Lee, and mailed to all persons, if any, who have requested said notice. Please be advised this meeting is being recorded and being broadcast on local TV and online at a future date. The Open Public Meeting Act allows for remote participation at board meetings and defines meeting as any gathering, whether corporeal or by means of communication equipment, which is attended by or open to all of the members of a public body held with the intent on the part of the members of the body present to discuss or act as a unit upon the specific public business of that body. Roll call, please. Mrs. Byers Kang? Present. Ms. Colbat? Here. Ms. Curry? Here. Mr. Knight? Here. Mrs. Cotain? Present. Mr. Lopez? Here. Ms. Morell? Here. Mr. Rubino? Here. Mrs. Richter? Here. The board convened executive session at 6.30 p.m. to discuss legal personnel and other confidential matters. Dr. Kravitz, we begin by sharing the superintendent's report. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, I'd like to first start off by congratulating Olivia Reed, one of our eighth grade students who happens to be the eighth grade North Miami Spelling Bee champion. In May, she will be going to Washington, D.C. So, congratulations to Olivia. Uh, I would like to introduce our high school students who will be speaking about what's happening in our high school Alexa Lopez and Kelly Seattle. So, um, three Fort Lee students were awarded the distinct honor of National Cyber Scholar and Finalist, one scholar and two finalists. Spring sports have officially begun and we look forward to all of our student athletes having a very successful season. On March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, our Academy of Theater Arts will be, will be performing the mean, mean Girls. Please come out and support our program. <laughs> On March 14th, our junior class ran a very successful basketball game between district faculty and the Harlem Wizards. Fun was had by all. The 11th graders completed the NJSLA testing last week. Finally, there will be a delayed opening on Wednesday, April 10th for students in 9th, 10th, and 12th grade. The 11th graders will be taking the SATs. Okay. Thank you. I would like to introduce our school business administrator, Ms. Dina Masseri. We'll be presenting an overview of this year's budget, actually the 24-25 school year's budget. Thank you. I know Jason's going to put up the um, presentation. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, please. So in order to prepare um, the school district budget, we always have meetings with the principals, supervisors, and directors. We review all the program proposals, staffing needs, any capital requests. We did the budget through committees also. Um, the finance committee actually met last week on Wednesday to actually go over the 24-25 um, budget. The budget has to be, uh, the tentative budget will be adopted tonight because it has to go down to the county office by Wednesday. The county has about a month to review the budgets and the actual public presentation will be um, on May 6th. So there's like all timelines that we have to adhere to. Can you go to the next slide, Jason? So right now we're gonna review the revenue sources. As you can see, the bulk of our budget is made up by tax levy. That's um, 
And for 24-25 in the Jefferson Fund, we had a 4.41% increase. And we also get um, pilot money that's aid in lieu of taxes. That's for various, I think, uh, building projects that occurred in the town. And instead of getting a regular tax levy, it's aid in lieu. We also have to use surplus to help balance the budget. As you can see, over the last couple of years, we've had to use surplus to balance our budget. We are going to be discussing for next year ways to reduce that number because it's very hard to always balance the budget on surplus. Extraordinary aid, that is um, an application that has to get done every school year. And it's money that you get back for special needs students, depending upon the type of programs that they attend and the type of services they have, that determines how much money you get back to the state. So we have seen some increases in that, so we're able to increase that revenue. Our miscellaneous revenue in one category went down, that's like for rental incomes, any like uh, refund of prior year expenses. Our interest um, revenue has gone up. We've seen a significant uh, increase in our interest revenue, so we were able to uh, budget for that revenue. Transportation fees are the fees that we charge for subscription busing. So those fees were able to get budgeted. The tuition is we have a preschool program where we have about 32 children who come to the district for regular preschool. We also have some other students who come to our district either as special needs or regular um, programming where the parents actually pay tuition for them or we have the districts that pay tuition. We do have a capital uh, reserve withdrawal, and I'll be going through that a little bit further on in the um, presentation of what we're going to use that for. The maintenance res uh, reserve withdrawal in our facilities, there's a lot of infrastructure items that we need to start addressing. So part of the things that I want to start addressing next year really has to start doing with some plumbing, electrical, concrete, um, sewage problems. I know, I think it was school number four, school number three, and I believe school number one have had some sewage problems um, and backups with toilets, so we really need to start addressing those. Um, and then the semi-revenue, again, that has to do with um, the special needs population, and based on the um, services they get, we can get a, money, uh, a piece of that back from the federal government. Then we go down to our grant areas, ESA, IDEA, state entitlements. <coughs> those are the grants that we get every single year. So ESA, that's your Title I, your Title II, your Title III, your Title IV. Um, IDEA is your Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that is also based on special needs students and the state entitlements that all has to do with your non-public so we get money for the non-public schools whether it's chapters 192 93 non-public technology non -public security aid non-public nursing non-public technology and that also goes to the non-public schools uh, Christ the teacher is the one that um, the teacher. That service is um, items that have been voted upon in the past, and that's the, the, repay, the repayment of the debt service. So I know probably need to do this one here and the projects that happen. I'm not sure what we did, but that's, that's all. Well. Can you go to the next slide, Jay? One of the things that we wanted to highlight upon is that we have been seeing an increase in our state aid. I mean, it's going up slowly, but at least we are seeing that number increase instead of it going downward. Um, as you can tell from the previous slide, where our, the bulk of our revenues come from property tax levy because the total budget, you saw about 75, about 75 million was coming from tax levy, and we get um, 58, million eight hundred thousand from state aid. So it would be nice if the state could kick in a little bit more so we could get a little bit of tax relief, but unfortunately, it's based on formulas and we don't really have much control over that. Next slide, please. Now to show you the breakdown of where all this money is spent. As you can see, almost 54 million is spent on your regular and special education programs. So what does that mean? That includes all your regular programming and special education, which includes the tuition for out of district placements. Um, Transportation is another area that we're seeing a lot of increases in. Um, just to send a child to an out of placement, sometimes depending upon where the location is, we can wind up spending like $80,000 for one route alone. And if there's no other kids, then we can't even um, share the cost with another district. If another child from another district is not even going to that, the district has to bear that, our own, that cost completely. Employee benefits is another area that's very big that makes up 16 million for 180,000. Those um, rates keep increasing every year. We were told that prescription benefits are going to increase 25% in 
Next year, regular health insurance is going to be anywhere from 9 to 12 percent at this point in time is what they're projecting. Next slide, please. This is just a, a quick summation of the appropriations for the year, and that's what your revenues are paying for. Next slide. Again, it's just a comparison from last year to this year and how much more we're spending for regular programs, special education, um, out of placement, which is out of district tuition. You can see that number went up a lot. We have a lot more children who are being placed in out of district placements. You can also see the transportation, the significant increase that also happens as you get more kids who are placed in out of district placement, the transportation costs do increase. And as I said before, the employee benefits amounts did go up. Next slide, please. This is tentative. When I spoke to Matt at the, um, the town, they don't have the 24 tax rate information yet. So this is just based on 2023 tax information. But on that average house that's assessed at $478,000, the property tax increase for the year is expected to be $133.08. Again, this most likely is going to go up because this is based on your 2023 tax figures. Matt said, by the time we have the public hearing, I should have the 2024 numbers. Next slide, please. Um, before I mention to you that we were going to do an appropriation from Capital Reserve, what we're um, appropriating this for is for the high school shop and training program. This is a really excellent program that we want to bring in district. It's going to teach uh, students plumbing, electrical, HVAC, and um, hopefully can write oh, and building maintenance. We're hoping some of those special needs students who do go out of district, but having a program like that here will bring them back into the district. And then maybe we could, it could even be like a revenue driver where kids from other districts would want to come to our program. Next slide, please. Some of the uh, projects that are currently underway is actually um, the middle school. The last part of that building that needs to be air conditioned is the academic wing. We actually just had our pre-bid walkthrough last Friday and the bid opening is scheduled for April 2nd. And we're hoping to have that done over the summer. So that comes September, I believe now all the buildings will be air conditioned. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So exactly what is all your money going to? It's sustaining um, all the existing academic programs, including the addition of new high school courses and academies. It supports our gifted and talented, your honor courses, your IB, your AP, your academic intervention, all contractual obligations. You know, we have flea and flag, so all the contractual obligations there are fulfilled. As I said before, we have increased costs in special education for out of district tuition related um, services, transportation costs, supplies. It also supports the alignment of the district curriculum to NJSLS. It also provides professional development opportunities for the staff. Next slide, please. What this is is comparing Fort Lee to other districts with our per pupil costs. And so you can see we're actually, you know, not too far off. We're kind of like right, actually at the lower end of the spectrum compared to all the other districts and what we spend per pupil for the um, education. Next slide, please. Those are all our board members. <laughs> Next slide, please. And any questions there? Does anybody have any questions on the budget? Like for the board? Uh, not so much questions. Thank you, Nina. Okay. Um, may I ask a question on the budget? Yeah. Um, um, I just want to applaud um, just for the first time that that presentation was very clear and um, it compares year to year. Um, transportation needs is a forefront topic for the area where I live, near school three. There's constant demand for it, and I see that there is actually surplus from that service. Is there any plan to expand it um, to more students? I know that many parents have asked, even though they live within that two mile radius. We're, we're actually in the process of having transplant um, come in and actually do the assessment of where all the kids live and actually what the distance is. So at this point in time, 
until we have all that data for all the students. I don't know if we can expand it or if it's going to have to be more like a subscription busing type situation. So in, in the past, we presented, excuse me, we presented this to the finance committee that we discussed. One of the things we noticed is that, um, you know, we want to make sure all the knowledge is correct for all of the students. Make sure that we're <laughs> utilizing, we have nine buses? We have nine drivers. Nine drivers who are busing our students, and many times they're doing multiple routes. The TransFinder, which is a program, will allow us to analyze each route and determine what it, what is cost effective and what is not. We have multiple routes that we outsource to South Kirby Jointure, which is a school district, but they also operate programs for districts to help outsource the busing. That's why we use companies like John Lackey or First Student. So with TransFinder, it does an analysis of all of your bus routes, both in-house and out of, out of outsourced, and then we determine what's the best economics for moving forward with all of our buses. Because we also have to take into account the long-term use of our bus. There are a lot of our buses who are coming to the life end. We are required by state statute of how long they have buses. Um, usually they have like a 12 year life and most of them are at the end of their life. So we also have to look at the fleet of our buses and see what we can do maybe to get some new vehicles in. And maybe some of them are not going to be buses because with some of the routes, if they're a little bit smaller, maybe we can get some minivans, which will actually be more effective. Also, if we have like some of these shorter routes. So if we are looking at busing actively because it is a significant cost for the district and how do we become more cost effective? Thank you. Um, the projection that were made, um, I, I see that we have made many considerations. Population growth is the key metrics that I know our district doesn't have any way right now. I mean, I, I haven't seen any reporting or any um, any model to try to predict what our student growth is, how do we address that as a district? Actually, when I look at the ASSA report over the, like, the last four or five years, our enrollment has been relatively flat. So even though maybe there's more building here, I, I don't know if that comes with students or if the parents are sending them to a different school, but from the ASSA report, our enrollment has not increased. So for example, from 2020 to 2021, we've had 4,443 students. 21 to 22, we had 4,464 students, which was an increase of only 21. 22, 23 school year, we had 4,435, which is a drop of about 29 students. And this year, our enrollment as of most recently is 4,139, which is a drop of almost 235 students. So even though the overall population may be flat, what we're hearing anecdotally from parents, there are bubbles within certain school or certain grade level, um, how is that addressed? So that, that's correct, there are bubbles, and also there's a disparity when you look at the class sizes among the different schools. So you might have a kindergarten class with 14 in one building, you may have that same kindergarten class in another building with 26, excuse me, 24 students. So that's all when we start to talk about the long-term strategic plan that we, that board should be discussing. How do we utilize our resources and make it effective for everyone? So there's some parity the schools. Uh, you know, we have we have quarreled with all ideas. That's something of a concern when we start to talk about that because it's a whole change in dynamics of how we do things. And in some cases, our programming as well, because we are a district where we every school has a specific program regarding special needs students and things like that. So when we look at all of that, that's that's a long term project to try to change that. Uh, but yes, there are bubbles in the schools. Thank you. That's the end of the super tax report. Thank you. Thanks, both. Um, do we have any committee reports? So the policy committee met uh, immediately prior to our executive session. Um, I think I could say honestly, the sole topic was uh, policy fifty-seven fifty-six and how it would operate under different scenarios uh, regarding school records, um, student requests to teachers. Um, it's clear that the situation remains very fluid. Um, we were provided with new information. Um, our administration has met with the owner of Genesis in understanding the capabilities of our student information system. Um, and then finally, um, at the urging of 
community members and board members. The idea initially uh, originated with Casey Knight. Um, a request has been made to establish an ad hoc committee uh, that would include a medical professional, school personnel, BEO members, uh, community members, parents, et cetera, um, to look at the re revised policy, to look at the original policy, to look at the guidance, um, and see if some common ground and compromise can be reached. And that request is with um, President Richard. May I have a motion to open the floor to the public. Well, okay. so before we do that, um, can we make comments about today's agenda, or do we wait until oh, the end? I'm sorry, I skipped over that. Excuse me, I'm tired. Okay. Um, do we have board members any questions or comments on tonight's agenda or any other topic? If I may. Um, good evening. Thank you, President Richter, Vice President Morrell, um, fellow board members, Dr. Kravitz, uh, Ms. Abagis, um, Ms. Baker, Ms. Mesury, thank you so much. Foley parents, students, teachers, neighbors, and community members, um, we have another full house. So thank you so much for taking your time to really care about our community and be here um, and to voice your perspective and, and, and allow that to be heard. Um, across the spectrum. As some of you may know that I am a longtime resident of Fort Lee and a Fort Lee High School alumna. My siblings and nephews are also Fort Lee High School alumni. My other nephew and children are currently enrolled in the district. My entire family tree is deeply rooted in Fort Lee. We're all proud product of the Fort Lee public education and we choose to be here. Among us is a former financial service executive, a physician, a high school science teacher, a Peabody winning producer. In short, Fort Lee Public Education had elevated many in my family. So the following remark I make in my capacity as an alumni, a parent, a Board of Education member, and a proud community members of Fort Lee. To say the least, the last 13 days have been unprecedented in Fort Lee. On March 4th, a walk-in resolution was motioned and voted in favor by five members for the first vote to abolish policy 5756. Now, two voting sessions are required for it to be repealed. A walk-in resolution means an item was not on the agenda. So board members, including policy committee members, were not pre previously informed or consult with on this walk-in resolution. And that was less than two weeks ago. On March 13th, a special meeting was requested for a second vote to abolish policy 5756. That's three business days before tonight's scheduled meeting. A nearly three and a half hour special meeting that cost the district thousands of dollars. To recap the public's commentary, 39 members of the community appear before the board to plead for a don't repeal and don't revise to policy 5756. 11 members of the community appear and advocated in favor of appeal, one of whom cautioned against any revision. Nonetheless, a motion was made to table the repeal pending a review of the re revision, and that was supported by five members of the board. And let me repeat, a special session was called only to have the motion to be tabled for follow-up review. On March 16th, so this past Sunday, we review the revision to 5756. A version was emailed to board members and only to find out this may not be the final version we vote on tonight. As committee chair, Ms. Kobath has alluded to, um, there were various scenarios that was discussed in the policy committee and the situation is fluid. So we're gonna vote on a fluid situation. Repeat, fluid. So let me repeat, 
the version of 3319 that is shared with the public may not be the same version we vote on. Policy 5756 is a significant policy, one that took experts years to develop, and we still don't have the final draft, yet we're supposed to read it, digest it, without consultation with any experts. And so I welcome the earlier invitation to invite a board, a border community and experts to opine on this. And let's be clear again, it's only been 13 days to review a policy that took years to write. To abolish or revise policy 5756 in a matter of days, despite the plea that we have heard, don't repeal, don't amend. That's reckless. To repeal and leave our district without any guidance will be irresponsible. A revision subject to our, a revision would subject our district to increased litigation risk. And that's just irrational. So I pose two key questions as we are rushed and usher to another vote. How was this revision draft? It wasn't draft with a panel of experts as 5756 was. There were educators, counselors, school psychiatrists, advocates, and parents. Were there one-on-one -on -one interviews? Who conducted them? Who were invited? How were these interviews promoted? Were there minutes kept? In short, where is the due diligence? So I repeat, this policy is supposed to serve the community while also ensuring that there's guidelines to our staff and to the district's teachers, leaderships to know what to do. Don't all of our students, not just transgender students, deserve deliberate measure and thoughtful review before changing policies of this gravity that affects them. I've learned that 3319 were authored through the lenses of maybe two or three board members who are just as unqualified as I am to draft these nuances. We just learned today about how our genesis system works today <laughs> at 530. It's been 13 days. How much time, the second question, how much time and attention should be afforded to our community to review? Since it's been table proposed, there's been versions and there will continue to be versions. So I ask, all of us know every word in a document, whether it's a deletion or addition, changes the intent and effect of a policy. And we plead for us to take time to work together. We heard the community loud and clear that you want to keep separate record in Genesis. I've been confirmed that those are the two concerns, that we can keep separate records in Genesis and that the application of policy 57, 56 among elementary school age kids address. Regarding to Genesis, as I mentioned earlier, we've been told tonight at 5.30 that that capability is there. Regarding the second concern relating to the policy among elementary school age students, there's actually nothing mentioned in the revision that would address that. So I'm appealing to you parents, students, friends, neighbors, to demand a process for a public hearing to create expert panel before board before the board requests for any repeal or revision to policy 5756, I'm just simply asking us to think, slow down. I encourage my fellow board members, if you fully understand the relationship between policy 5756, policy 3319, and the law against discrimination, 
if you have, if you have one shred of doubt and hesitation, if you don't know what the term non-binary or cisgender means, or have uncertainty over the policy and how the policy would expose the district to litigation risk, please reaffirm 5756. Affirming 5756 allow the district to stay in compliance and offer an opportunity to learn the nuances of policy 5756. In closing, President Rector, I don't know um, if I need a, to hit my Jeopardy buzzer first this time. Can I put forth a motion? Can I put forth a motion to rescind the resolution for the abolishment of policy 5756 and affirm policy um, 5756? Because the motion to rescind was not priorly noticed to the other board members, it is subject to a two thirds vote. The super majority is not the normal five vote, it is two thirds, so it's six member vote. But last time when it was brought up as a walk in, why don't we need the two third? Because this is a motion to rescind the previous. Uh, uh, as opposed to. As opposed to just a walk on to approve another resolution. Maybe better off with it all. Um, so I just wanted to just briefly touch on something. I don't want to speak a lot, but I did want to touch on a few things. And one of the things that I wanted to touch on was the genesis of thirty of thirty three nineteen. The genesis of thirty three. I am not qualified to do many things in this life. I'm not qualified to fix my car. I'm not qualified. I'm not very good at marriage, apparently. But one thing that I'm definitely qualified to do is to cross off something that I do not agree with. Something that is against my values. I am, I am more than qualified to do that, Mr. McCann. So I just wanted to address that. So, and again, it's my turn, and I appreciate it if you could give me a chance to speak. Thank you. So that's the genesis. The genesis of, of 3319 is that a whole bunch of people showed up, a whole bunch of people shared their opinions, their life, their experiences, they shared a lot of stuff. And we, we absorbed that, we listened to it. And I had long conversations with people. There are people in this room who I can show my cell phone. I had three hour conversations with people who will not return my poll poll after tonight, I can assure you. Okay, I listened. I listened to, to the children that wrote letters. We listened to all that. And we came to the conclusion that we needed to keep a lot of these protections in place for these kids. We needed to keep most of them. We needed to keep most of them. And that's why I took my pen, my magical pen, which I'm so skilled at using and crossing off things I don't agree with, and I crossed off one section. One section. Section five for those who are uh, who have in front of them, right? And it, and it doesn't discuss record keeping in general. Our problem with it was that with 5756, if a six-year-old child walks into a classroom and says, I want to wear a dress and I want to be called this name, Right now, a file is pretty much over. At least they are, they're gonna sit down with a the child, they're gonna figure out a plan, they're gonna create another set of school records that are in a name that the parents can't access. I think it's too early at age six or seven or eight to do this. That's, that's my personal opinion. And, and, and it's okay if I get voted out of office, it's okay. I'll have a lot more free time on my hands and get in trouble elsewhere. I gotta say, I gotta stand up for what I believe in. And I know this is not going to make me popular at all, but I don't care. I just simply do not care. Six-year-old children, six-year-old children, I have a seven-year-old daughter sitting at my home right now. I love her to death. Anyone in this room knows me, knows how much I love her, okay? My seven-year-old child is not going to walk into, and she's not old enough, and I'm not okay with her walking into a room and asking for an adult to create a unique set of records that will be completely inaccessible to me without any, without any due process whatsoever. I think one of the scariest, I think one of the scariest things that's happening here 
is, is that while well, we're trying to take care of the kids, we're trying to look out for them. We're losing. No, Yes, he is. Okay, okay. okay. the public will stop. It's my turn to speak, and you'll have a turn to speak too, and I'll listen just like I have. Okay. Um, again, I, and, and I've kind of lost my train of thought. Um, again, what I'm trying to say is for a seven year old kid, I, I don't think it's appropriate for us. I don't think it's appropriate for a unique set of records. I think if a child walks into school age six, seven, eight, and wants to, um, wants to dress how they want to dress, they should be, that decision should be honored, should be honored. If that kid wants to go to school and, and, and share their gender identification with their teacher, that should be a trusted adult, that should be completely private. That conversation should never go to the parents. And anyone that would insinuate that any of the five of us that voted to make this one slight modification is wrong. It is. It, it is so just in closing, in closing, no, no, continue. I was just going to ask the members of the public, please allow Mr. Ryan yeah. to speak. In closing, I know this is a super, super um, important topic and one that we're really passionate about. And that's why, you know, when, when Paula just mentioned that during the policy committee, they had discussed the possibility of having an ad hoc committee. And I support that 100%. I would love nothing more than an opportunity to sit across the desk from Amy. Um, and, and have some of these discussions. I would love it. And I would love for members of the community to come. And I don't think we're in a big rush to do this. I agree with you. I, I don't think we're in a big rush. We do need to take our time. But I think we need to we need to protect parents too. We need to protect kids. But we need to also protect people who have done everything in their power. So these are the people who are caring for their kids. They're the ones that are dropping them off in the morning. They're the ones getting them dressed. If we're so afraid of these parents, how are we sending these kids home to them every night? If our parents are so dangerous, if our parents are so dangerous, we need to take a look at ourselves as a community. We really do. So I just want to say one last thing. I am in full support. I am not for the support of the repeal of, of, uh, of this policy prior to having a replacement. I'm not. I never was. I don't want our kids to go one day without the protections of 57, 56 until we have something else in place. I certainly hope that I won't be forced tonight to vote one way or the other about it without an opportunity to further discuss it. Okay. And I really hope that you will give us a chance. If, if you really want to sit down and if you really want to compromise, like you say you do, and if you really want to come together with members of the community, like you say you do, then I would suggest voting to Voting to table the repeal again and creating an ad hoc committee which can explore this further and can do so in, in, a, in, a, in a more relaxed way. Thank you. So I, I, I can't say anything better you know, than what Casey just said. I'm obviously in favor given the um, the, the, the comments over the last few meetings um, to establish an ad hoc committee, and I hope that decision can be made tonight. Um, I do want to comment on a couple of things, though. Um, in, in Fort Lee, we, we, we enjoy, we, we want to have robust discussion. We want civilized um, discussion. We want thoughtful and respectful discussion. Um, this Saturday, as, as I think you all know, because I was on the Zoom and people were criticizing me for being on vacation and calling for a special meeting. The special meeting was called long before I left for vacation, but because of certain notice requirements, our central office couldn't get the notice done in time. And so that's why the meeting took place. It didn't, wasn't asked for while I was on vacation. But while I was on vacation, one, one or more of you took it upon yourselves to prepare an email signed Fort Lee LGBTQ community. And you sent that email to the managing partner of my law firm, the general counsel of my law firm, and three other partners of mine seeking to have me fired for coming here and speaking publicly at a meeting about my views. The email is filled with outrageous lies and for, for that your community to try to interfere with someone's livelihood because I volunteer my time, I come, I do my homework, and I have a view that's different from yours is despicable. 
And we're going to find out who was behind sending this, but we don't do this in Fort Lee. We come, we express our opinions. We don't try to get the nine people up here fired. And, and you know, it, it talks about I, some of your facts were wrong, but that I'm leading and I'm spearheading this horrible right wing conspiracy with Doug Lopez and Casey Knight and Tanya. And it's just outrageous. And, and, and I would hope that this would be the last time you send anyone an email of this sort. If I, I, I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to even read it with what was put in it. Not an ounce of truth. Not an ounce of truth in this, all designed to have me fired. You know, I, I have a son in college and it's just absolutely outrageous that, that the people that consider themselves the Fort Lee LGBTQ community would send something like this, an, an anonymous email to my partners. So on, on the policy, this process that we've been undergoing, while, while brutal to some and time consuming and emotional, is exactly the way this process is supposed to work. You have a policy, people want changes, they, they bring forward the changes, their people give comments, and so there's, while, while it's taking more time than any of us would like, it's how this process works. A school board is charged with two things. They set the policy and they hire a superintendent. Those, and well, on our agendas, we approve hirings and things of that sort, the two primary things that a board does. So this policy is important and we are listening to everyone and revisions are being made and suggested in response to your comments. And so, Again, I, I, under the circumstances, I mean, I'd be very happy to vote tonight and have the five people and, and, and we get the new policy in. But that's not, I think, the best thing for our community right now. I'm not trying to rush this through. I, 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 I am someone who listens to the community and reacts. And so I would hope that everyone who goes up that in, endorses the establishment of an ad hoc committee that will include parents, community members, um, you know, the, the different categories of people, you'll, you'll endorse it so that it can get done and it can get done quickly. Thank you. So the, um, the notion of an ad hoc committee was brought to my attention at 5.30 this evening. Um, I never said that I was against an ad hoc committee. I wouldn't call it really an ad hoc committee because our ad hoc committees only consist of board members. So I would think that we would have to call it something else. Um, but I was asked at 5.30 to have a decision by 7.30 about the start of tonight's meeting of whether I was in favor of this or not. And I, I just think it's another rushed situation. I am tired of playing games with the children of this town. We had a walk-on resolution a few weeks ago to abolish 5756, which protects the children. We had a special meeting and we sat through hours of comments from the public and board members to simply have a resolution to table it and kick it down the road a little longer. And now we're having that same discussion. And while I am absolutely in favor of listening to people from this town and the children and the parents who experience these situations, as well as the children and the parents who have spoken against 5756, I am not in favor of kicking this down the road again and saying, well, let's table another resolution that is on the agenda. We need to make a decision, keep the policy in place, or take the vote to get rid of it, but we are not continuing. I am not in favor of continuing to table and table and table and let's wait another meeting and drag everyone out of their houses every single night to stand here for three hours and scream at each other in the audience. That is not the town that I moved to to raise my children in. Everyone is allowed to have their opinions, not using the children of this town in one way or another as bait and as a game 
so that the adults can have their feelings and voices heard. We are all allowed to voice our opinions and disagree with each other, but the, the way I've seen people communicate with each other online and in public the past few weeks is disgusting. Whether I am on your side or not on your side, I will still respect you. I see plenty of people who are clapping when others are speaking and they know how I feel about this issue and I still see them and say hello to them and kiss them when they walk in the room and they are still people I will acknowledge even if we don't agree on this issue. And I wish the rest of the people out there would do the same thing. We can all be neighbors and get along even if we don't see eye to eye on everything. So I really encourage us all to start learning how to function like some of the children who have spoken in the last few weeks have presented themselves in a respectful manner and not being so uh, disrespectful to each other. But um, as I said, I'm not gonna keep repeating myself, I am in favor of let's take this vote and end this because I'm not kicking the can down the road anymore. And if we do want to form a committee of people to discuss this further, great, but I'm not dangling this carrot in front of the horse anymore. I'd like to make a motion to vote on an ad hoc committee meeting, please. I think it, I'm looking at policy 0155 right now, and it, we should refer to it as a standing committee. And it states the board, the board, may authorize the establishment of such standing committees from amongst its membership as it finds necessary to study operations in specific areas and to make recommendations for board action. So I'll second the motion to establish an ad hoc committee uh, relating to policy 5756 and related policies. I, I, didn't I raise a motion before you guys did? Doesn't my motion get to be voted on first? I motioned earlier to rescind the repeal or the abolishment of 5756. You phrased it as a question. You didn't actually make the motion. Okay. Well, since we're still in the discussion, okay. of policy 5756. And I will do related policies. So it Standing committee policy 57. Standing. What are the questions you're asking? Standing. That's what I said. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. Can well, we need discussion on the motion that's on the table. Is that what this is about? Okay. So the uh, in regards to the motion that's on the table, could we still have a vote on um, the, can someone else make up can Amy's motion still be made afterwards? And we can still vote on the other policy. Okay, thank you. Procedurally, if we still have a question, are we out of the discussion yet? I'm going to vote or not. You're, you're discussing this motion right now. Okay. So I just want to point out to the public. The revision, if you were to go and pull them, I don't know how many of you wait. We're, we're having a discussion on their motion first, so then oh. we can go back to your. Okay. Anyone have a discussion or questions on the motion made by Mr. Knight? Can you state the motion again? Yeah. You want to state it or you want to use Yeah, it? do you want to or you want me to? Either way, yeah, I, I'd like to make a motion to Sorry. form an ad hoc or standing committee to discuss uh, the repeal. On fifty seven fifty six. Mrs. Byers Kang. Yes. Ms. Colbath. Yes. Ms. Curry. Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Ms. Cotang? No. Mr. Lopez? 
No. Ms. Morrell. No. Mr. Rubino. No. Mrs. Richter. No. Abstain. Did you say abstain? Yeah. It's um four four. I'm trying to read from them. I'm reading on the standing committee on policies right now. Have a question. Our policies, standing committees are such as negotiations, curriculum. You can create a standing committee uh, and, and our committees. Um, if you look at the law, the, uh, the one person can actually create an ad committee on their own. Yes. But this is, but this, well, no, this is this, this is a look for a standing committee. You can always vote to dissolve uh, a committee. You, the president the president is the president's okay. 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 only talking about board committees. It's, it's the same rules for. Like, do you want members of the public on there? Yeah, so yeah. and you can select categories or individuals. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to read up on. It's, um, I don't think it's all standing. I know in the in the motion, Mr. Miller stated it was the game. So, I know, and it's a lot of right to it's standing. So that's what I'm. I think we can give it any name that we want. Historically, when we were uh, doing the referendums a number of years ago, we had an ad hoc committee and it included members of the public in different groups. We called that at the time an ad hoc committee uh, because it was for a unique purpose. I don't think the name that we give it is all that significant, um, but we call it the ad hoc standing committee. It can be dissolved when its work is done. I think we're waiting for your vote. You, oh, you say it was four four. If you it's four four. It's four four. Okay. The motion doesn't pass. Before that, I just want to point out there are a couple of revisions that are proposed in the current policy, 3319. The very first sentence, the Board of Education is committed to providing a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment for all students, was struck out. Diane, can you please address that? Good evening, everyone. So historically, the way that our policy revision process operates is that you take the proposed revision, you compare it to the current policy, and whatever language, whatever new language is proposed is reflected in bold print. Whatever language is, is not proposed that is in the current policy, I'm sorry, that is proposed that is not in the current policy, 
is stricken. So upon receiving the draft of 3319 on Thursday, last Thursday, we had to, by process, by policy revision process, compare it to the current 5756. The draft that was provided to us was actually the New Jersey Department of Education um, guidance for transgender students. It wasn't necessarily an actual revision of the, of the current policy. So what my office does is we compare the two. And so because that sentence that Ms. Kotang referenced or any language that was in that draft that was not in our current policy, that was stricken. That particular sentence did not appear in the document. And so that is why it was stricken on what was posted to the agenda. That is an example of why we're not qualified. These provisions are made in a haste. 5756 has worked without any negative issues. And therefore, I motion for the resent to resent the repeal of 5756. Motion on the table to rescind the repeal of 5756. So that is the vote that was taken as the walk on on March 4th meeting. Is that what you're talking Correct. about? Correct. Okay. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. I have a second. I by Ms. Morell. Discussion? Questions? Can you just clarify what the. Um, she made a motion to rescind. The vote to repeal 5756 that was walked on and voted on on March 4th, two weeks ago at the meeting. Is that, is March is that typical? That um, I'm asking our attorney. Is yeah, that, it's, 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 yeah. it's, or is that is that something that typically happens? Most it's, of it's, something, it's something It's something provided for in the as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Oh. So she's, we, there was a walk on motion, and explain this one. There was a walk on motion on March 4th made to repeal 5756, right. and that one went five to four. Right. Ms. Koteng is now making a motion that we rescind that repeal, which would then Mean to affirm that these seven pieces. So let me clarify. Let me clarify the word. So, so under your bylaws, to approve, repeal, rescind, and then any policies requires two votes. You had. I was in the meeting. But I, uh, my understanding is you had the first vote on March fourth. So you need another vote for the repeal to become effective. Ms. Kotang is making a motion to rescind that first approval. So then, if you want to repeal that, if, assuming that that motion passed, you would have to have two more votes again to repeal 57. Does that make sense? Okay, so this discussion. Any other discussion? This is just a legal basis. That's all. That's all. No, it's to unwind a vote. Cool. That's therefore leaving it as it's yeah, yeah, yeah. basically. Well, we'll get the well, we get the rescinds that previous. Well, leave it as it is. Correct. Mm -hmm. I have it's a motion to rescind walk, the walk motion to rescind the walk on motion of three four to repeal policy fifty seven fifty six on March fourth. Right? It's a motion to repeal the walk on motion from March fourth. Motion to rescind. It's a motion to rescind. The, the March 4th resolution it's a, of abolishing 
policy. It's to be said. Okay, to be said. Does it not matter that that was tabled already? Uh, no, table one, it just defers action right. to a different time. Okay. So it's a motion to rescind the walk-on motion on 3-4 to repeal policy 5756. It's to rescind the walk-on motion from March 4th to repeal policy 5756. Yes, that's what this will be. Yes, that's what I'm saying, yes. right? And we're still having public comment. After this. Okay. Can I just ask? Yeah. So, to be clear. So, uh, the yes vote would be to keep the percentage in place. Correct. The yes vote would be to rescind the prior motion to vote. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand. It basically means that if there is another meeting where someone makes a motion to Heal 57 56, that they would have to have a second meeting after that. Okay. Right now, there's only one meeting remaining because we able to meeting. Okay. Okay. okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Cotain and a second by Ms. Right. Okay. 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 Ms. Byers, can I? We're out of the discussion process. So, okay, so then I'm staying. Yeah, I'm saying okay. Ms. Colbath? No. Ms. Curry? Yes. Mr. Knight? No. Mrs. Cotang? Yes. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mrs. Morell? Yes. Mr. Rubino? Yes. Mrs. Richter? Yes. Okay, so that motion carries. <laughs> A motion to rescind without the prior notice. That's what I need to do. Two, three, four, five. Well, you, you have two thirds because you have six. Yes, I know. I was just okay. about checking. Okay. <laughs> counting. Thank you. Um, okay. Are we done for comments and questions? So there. Nah, I'm not having anything to say. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, motion to open the floor to the public. Well, okay. Motion for all second. Cotain, all in favor? Any opposed? Extensions? Okay. Uh, we'll hear first from members of the public that are physically located in the cafetoria. Then we'll take questions and comments from those participating in the party. Please address your comments to the board. For remote public participants, select the raise hand button. District Technology Coordinator Mr. Jarrow will recognize each community member in the order to raise hands. Please unmute your microphone, state your name and home address for the record, and leave your comments. Please, everyone, limit your comments to three minutes. And I know there's a lot probably, so if you want to get in line, so you want to speak to over you, please do that. All right, step up. Name and address for the record. Could you give me one second? This is Jason. I just want to troubleshoot the audio real quick. Just one second. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Hello, my name is Cheryl. I live on 1265 Fifth Street. I have a kindergartner in the district and a one year old I need to get home to and fly out towards the top. I'm a medical professional and my sisters are in education as well. I know that we are all obligated to support it and we are constantly as parents being surveillance. And this policy just confuses me. Because as parents and guardians, we are constantly being urged to be on the same page as educators. 
We are asked to help students with their behavior, their homework, their activities, and volunteer. This policy contradicts all of that and erodes the trust between parents and educators who need to be on the same team to help develop productive members of society. That's all I'm going to say. Have a nice night. Brad Raimondo, 2298 from I would like to congratulate the Board of Education on the vote that you just took. I would like to congratulate the Board of Education on taking the action that is consistent with the Code of Ethics that you all swore to uphold as members of this board. The Code of Ethics that includes the phrase, I will uphold and enforce all laws, rules, and regulations of the State Board of Education. So I congratulate you on voting to keep in place the best practice guidelines from the New Jersey Department of Education on how to safeguard the civil rights of LGBTQ students. Your code of ethics also includes the phrase, I will seek to develop and maintain public schools that meet the individual needs of all children. So I want to congratulate you on the vote you just took to create a safe and supportive environment for LGBTQ youth. Your code of ethics also states, I will help to frame policies and plans only after the board has consulted those who will be affected by them. And so I congratulate you on listening to the voices of the LGBTQ youth of this community, to the Fort Lee Teachers Union, to the parents, both of LGBTQ youth and allied with them, who have come to these meetings and spoken out in favor of keeping this policy in place. And your code of ethics includes this perhaps most important phrase, I will refuse to surrender my independent judgment to special interests or partisan political groups. And so I congratulate the members of this board who understand that doing the right thing for our students, doing the right thing to shield our district from potential litigation, outweighs any obligation you may feel because of a deliberately vague political slogan you may have adopted during a campaign. And I want to congratulate the members of this board for recognizing that this circus has gone on long enough, that the message of callousness and unwelcome towards LGBTQ youth in our town, created by the March 4th vote, has lingered long enough, and congratulate this board on restoring their integrity and the heart of our town by voting to rescind that vote from March 4th. Thank you. Thank you.
This is, in fact, the reason I didn't come out for quite a while, and it's the case for quite literally every single one of my friends that I know. The fear of retaliation, whether emotional or physical, is real. Children have been kicked out of their homes for being transgender, have been abused psychologically and physically, and that, can, and that causes irreparable damage to the effects of health. The consistent response to this is that, is, that, is, that, is that we are trying to defend kids from gender ideology. However, without parental consent, kids can't get any kind of gender-affirming care. All forms of medication require parental consent. So, all that 5756 allows children to do is to have, is to have a safe space to explore their identity free of any, free of any possible retaliation from their parents. By repealing 5756, all that would be changed is a safety net for children to have a safe exploration of their identity would be removed and children would be at risk to that retaliation. For a more personal note, I know that if I had been forcefully outed to my parents, I would have been completely devastated. It took me a very long time to figure myself out. In some respects, I still can. And having myself outed before I felt the time was right would have internally destroyed me. Now, before I finish, I wanted to touch on one more thing. There is some talk of, there is some talk of the political group Moss for Liberty being here. And I, so for any possible speeches that may come after that, I wanted to preface all of those speeches with, with the fact that according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Moms for Liberty is an extremist hate group that has advocated for banning books, spreading hateful rhetoric against every minority group, they call for the complete abolition yeah. of the. Thank you. Uh, your time's up. Just wrap up your thought. All right. In in some in summation, in summation, for all of these reasons, for the safety and protection of kids and their continued well-being, do not ever bring a vote to repeal fifty-seven fifty-six again and completely abolish any notion of slavery. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Alexander Dominguez, and I live at 2137 South Street. Hello, I'm Matthew Brodsky, and I live at Four Horizon Road, and we're juniors at Fort Lee High School. Uh, so I want to start off saying, um, good job on coming to a consensus on, on the vote. Um, it's my first time in the halls of government. Uh, kind of a crazy first time, I'm going to be honest, but it was really crazy to me seeing how like up like these halls where you know it's supposed to be cordial and stuff and having so many people fighting and arguing and throwing insults at each other in the back and also having this lady over here having basically her livelihood um almost being stripped from her because of people who though because of people who just I don't know were mad and I don't know, I don't think whatever, for any future discussions that we have that may be a partisan or may fall close to partisan lines, I don't think that us as a people should be arguing with each other. And I think we just be more cordial with each other and be more friendly with each other. So yeah, and now my friend Matt is going to take it. Would it also be able to, would I be able to ask what exactly it is you guys want to change from the policy if not to take away the rights of transgender students? What exactly is it that it is needed to be changed? Is that a good ask? Or... I'd say generally the policy doesn't call for a QA, although I know past practice, maybe sometimes we do a little QA, but I would generally, like now that that's not being voted on, I don't know if it's necessary to. Answer that question. Are you finished with asking all of your questions? Yeah, I just want to understand what, why we're all so partisan over if transgender transgender students' rights aren't being um, protected. Then why is everyone you know so partisan? That's why I don't understand what exactly is being changed or reformed. What was going to be reformed in the policy? Okay, so I let the people who were part yeah. of the drafting of the new proposed um, address it, but it's just not going to get back and forth. So if they answer it, and I'm going to be super brief, I'm yeah. going to be super brief. Listen, I'm, I'm looking in the eye when I say this to you, we didn't strip anyone from these kids. 
I really wanted. The only concern that we had, the concern that I had, that the reason I just voted the way I did is to make the inside, but of course do so. The only thing I was concerned about is that the six-year-old child should not have separate school records in a name that their parents don't have access to. If that happens later on, that's completely fine with me. Or, oh, I won't say that, but I, I'm not going to argue that. But um, just for the youngest kids, I think they, before they have permanent records uh, created, they should have a chance to actually explore a little bit first. I mean, they don't know if, what their situation is. They don't know. They're exploring. Why are we creating records that their parents don't have access to at age six and seven? So that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, I know it's after the board set. And I have three kids of mine. And the ages are different. I have 24, I have 17, I have 7 years. And throughout their lives, they do change their minds. Right? And I need to be, as a parent, I need to be involved in everything. I need to know what they're going through. If the school, if they go to school and something happens and the teachers know more than I, because the kids actually spend the majority of their times at school, I need the teacher or the school to reach out to me and to inform me what's going on with my child. So I have, I have knowledge, I, have, uh, I can support my child in every situation. I have a seven-year-old child right now, and I'm concerned. If I would not be informed of what's going on with my child, and seven-year-old, you know, she listens to Mickey Mouse, and whatever, she heard something, she didn't even understand what's going on, and she's already talking about it. She came, two, two days ago, she came to my to, uh, to school, and she said, Mommy, you know what? School is more the most important thing. The teacher is the most important in my life, and you are the second thing. And this is not okay with me. I need to be a part of her life. I need to have a future. I just cannot trust to bring my child to school where I don't have any knowledge what's going on with my child. So please, I really want to consider this, especially for the younger children. I understand I have a 17 year old. She can decide on her own. And she can already decide what she wants to talk to me or she doesn't want to talk to me. Yet even then, I would love for, t for school to reach out to me and tell me, you know what? You have to look into this. You can look into uh, speaking with a uh, psychologist or anyone else and uh, accept it. But you have to, you are as a parent, you have to be involved in the child's life. That is my Jason, can you restart the timer when she starts speaking? Thank you. Jenya, I'm just five to Rory Lane. I have five children in the district. I would like to say that the policy itself was introduced in 2014. So these are some facts that I heard last meeting. The policy itself was introduced in 2014, but the specific guidelines we're talking about today were an update to the original policy brought in 2019. Um, this, that the parental rights we're talking about are settled constitutional law. Supreme Court case, Droxel versus Brando. I have handouts for those who want to see this. I have about 20 with me. I can email more if anyone's interested. 
And now to, the, to my key point is that parental involvement is key for preventing suicide. There is a 2017 study from South Korea that shows parental support was independently related to a decrease in suicidal ideation. Uh, P value less than 0 0.001, which is very statistically significant. Again, I have links. Um, citing from a Psychology Today publication, as I understand, these are psychology experts who say that research between 2015 and 2018 found that suicide attempts were significantly higher for students who are identified as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or questioning. Parental support, peer group support, and online support can be crucial with parental support in the first place. In buffering and working with school or community situations that may be less receptive. So what is the biggest reason for teen suicide? I would argue social media, and we can see a steady increase in teen suicide from 2000 on because of social media. Uh, I mean, correlation is not causation, but it's a pretty telling trend. Uh, now, please tell me, uh, I can log on to Genesis and look at my kids' grades anytime I want, and I know there are tensions between parents and kids over grades. So why are you reporting grades to us? And to be honest, I can't believe those board members who got elected on this issue who just voted to resign this vote. Please um, state your address for me. I live in 43 in, in the Terrace, 1223. I have two kids in this district, and I'm against policy 5756. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old boy. I raised him. Um, Can you see your dress for the record? I'm not going to say I'm not going to say I raised my son by myself. And I feel that having him was a responsibility and make it like it's a face about decisions that we all make. My son is my responsibility. He's my responsibility. And no one should have anything from my son. From my son to me. Um, so my heart breaks even to hear that other people can make decisions and to my son, me not knowing. He was born with left lip and um left lip and palate as well. Bilateral uh left lip. I was with him the whole time. Making all the decisions. And it really breaks my heart to even think that other people can hide things from me, not knowing the things I've been through with him and the things that he's been through. He's been through a lot of also uh, thoughts, not good thoughts. He was able to say things to me. Thank God as well. He started to know. He's back. And he's opening up. All those doors are gone. 
I have been I've got it all. And I know my son is now the best in the best genes. But it's not a fair time because of we love people and we all as parents should make the decision to teach our kids and teach all of us to love each other. And I think that there is hate or that we discriminate or that we look like, no, we love each other. My, love, my son loves everyone. We love, we're, we're here to love. And not to hate, and not to talk back to each other and hide and take our rights. Raffiarelli, Bergenfield, New Jersey. I come tonight and I listened carefully to everyone who spoke. And the concern that keeps rising up is, well, the children aren't going to be safe with their parents if they go and tell them that they're a different sexual orientation. I have three kids. I have 13 grandkids ranging from all different ages. And we come from a loving family, and a family which I'm sure live in Fort Lee, because I know many families in Fort Lee, that have loving parents that truly care about their kids. Mothers that bore their kids, that they go to the school system, and policies are made by people like you that are not looking at a family unit, you know, families are functional, where they can speak into their children's lives, give them a place of comfort, have a place of rest in their home, when they come out of the public place in the public school, that they can begin to live their life. And what we're doing here, and what you're doing here, this wonderful board of people, you're saying we're going to take children from kindergarten and, and grammar school and middle school and we're going to expose them to a different type of lifestyle that may not agree with their parents. But listen, in the Western civilization, it's the parents' freedom to bring their children up the way they choose. It's an American constitution. <laughs> generated by a political agenda or maybe a personal like or dislike, what you're forgetting is that you, my friends, are, are, are choosing the future of children and taking it out of the culture, out of ethnicity, out of where we live in a melting pot of people who come from all around the world who have very close ties, Eastern Europeans, the South American families, very close family ties. And what you're forgetting is you're putting a spin on it to allow an American mindset that's quite liberal from a lot of different places in the world. And you're allowing this to take place where you want to not rescind 57, 6, 56, and things like that. Listen, if folks want to live transgender, God bless them. But don't implement it into a family that has a family unit and then hold back information from the parents. You're going to call them and tell them about their dirty gym clothes and the grades that they have and that the kid acted out in class and the bullying, I think, and excuse me if I'm speaking out of turn, maybe you're bullying parents. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Crickson. I have two children in the district, and I'm on Second Street, Fort Lee. Uh, second, uh, yes, in the district. Sorry. Um, I love Fort Lee. Um, I love my LGBTQ neighbors. I love my transgender family member. Um, and I love our teachers and staff in Fort Lee who are incredible. Uh, I want to thank the board members for their vote tonight. Um, very supportive of this. Um, I 
that the Attorney General said it best when he said we're appealing 57 56. Transgender students lose protections because the specificity is lost from the diet. I also want to say for parents that are concerned from Fort Lee that are concerned that they lose that information, the policy clearly says, again, for the health and safety of a student, the school district may disclose a student's status. So they're allowed to in those cases. Um, for our Board of Education members who may not be aware, uh, Moms for Liberty put out a call on Facebook. And as I look around the room, I see a lot of faces that are very unfamiliar from Fort Lee. For those of you who are not familiar with Moms for Liberty, it was designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as an extremist group, a hate group. Across the country and across the state, they've been banning books. They've been ending references to racial discrimination and LGBTQ people. They've been banning books about Martin Luther King and Ruby Bridges. They've been attacking teachers, librarians, and staff as groomers. And the chair of Moms for Liberty Bergen County may put out a call for dismantling public education. Uh, for those of you not from Fort Lee, we have a sign in our town that says, Be Fort Lee. And I'd like to say, those values are not Fort Lee. And I want to thank this board again for upholding 5756. Excellent job. And I'm here to tell you that I am very disappointed that six of the board members that voted to take in place something that they took information away from me that I am the mother of my child and I am in my right to know everything that is going on with him while I sent him to school. I sent him to school to be nurtured. I don't send him to school for teachers who are not qualified to take decisions and to make up rules for my child. I was proud to be in Fort Lee. Today I am in Knows this, it does not work. 
actually backfires. Some developmental psychologists call this stage, quote, separating from childhood at home. It is hard for kids and arguably harder for parents. Policy 5756 was created by policy professionals who share everyone's goal to guard against child endangerment. We are here as a community to protect our children. Let us continue to protect and care for them by allowing policy 5756 to remain in place and unchanged. Just give me one second. We're just troubleshooting the audio again. Okay, thank you. Okay, you go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Cleveland, Five Horizon Road. I'm kind of winging it here, but I felt compelled to come up both to express my gratitude to each of you, including those who voted in a way that I didn't personally hope for, um, for your thoughtfulness, for your consideration for what I believe is ultimately your respect for the children of Fort Lee. I don't have any children of my own yet, perhaps one day. Um, what I do know about parenting though, is that a meaningful, well-cultivated relationship between a parent and their child is not something that will be changed by one policy or another. Um, that said, a policy such as 5756 gives children the autonomy and freedom to explore the world in and of themselves, uh, especially at school, a place which is meant to be an opportunity for learning for personal growth, uh, to find one's own autonomy in the world, 5756 allows that. It does not prevent a parent from fostering a, um, a supportive, nurturing, and open relationship with their child, such that their child would feel comfortable coming to them and talking to them. 5756 does not establish a, a dynamic where parents and children are separated from one another at all. It gives children the trust and respect and freedom that so many of us claim to uh, believe in deeply in this, in this country the freedom of self-expression, self-exploration, uh, the freedom to discover one's own identity and place in the world. And I'm very grateful for those of you who uh, voted to repeal the, you know, we went through the, <laughs> all the terminology there. Um, I have a great deal of respect to, again, to all nine of you for the process by which you've gone through this. And uh, all I will say to wrap up is for those parents who are concerned that your child might not talk to you or trust you, that's something that will not be solved by a school policy. That's something you need to do. I live in the Med North building. Uh, believe it or not, the, the knife edit 
<laughs> on this stage. Uh, I'm honestly all very pleasantly surprised at how the, the bill turned out, but I feel like I really do need to say this so that this never happens again. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start this by making sure that you all reckon with the fact that you brought the attention of a recognized hate group to into our town. Again, you brought a hate group here. I moved to Fort Lee a year and a half ago. I bought an apartment with money I've been saving my whole life, and I chose to start my next phase of adulthood here in this town. And you brought a hate group here. It's actually infuriating because I already have enough of a hard time convincing friends and family to suffer the GWB traffic to come over here. Now I have to also explain to my trans friends that no, my town doesn't actually hate you. They just don't want trans kids underneath the age of 12 to have civil rights. I also want to speak to some of the behavior that I witnessed last week. The faint remorse, clutching at your faces, acting as if this vote is such a hard moral conundrum. I never want to see similar reluctance from this board, coming from this board to do the right thing ever again. Uh, we can see when you are chit-chatting with, casting side glances at, and kicking with people who will stand at this podium and call your teachers child molesters. I hope to see you all at Fort Lee Pride, because I know my community will be there, ready to remind you all that you brought a hate group into our town. You are the You are the Please, please. Thank you very much. Very disappointing to those who complained on parental rights by fleet. Uh, I have more respect to the opposite board members who, compla who complained on uh, upholding 5756. At least they were honest. So uh, at least I knew what to expect. Now, regarding the other side, uh, what Paula said, it was ridiculous. and. Uh, the other side labeled a few board members as an extremist. This is ridiculous and unacceptable. So I have to remind everyone that these board members were, were legitimately elected by majority of Fort Lee residents. Yeah. So does that mean that the majority are extremists? Can you, anyone tell me? No? So uh, basically, uh, from my personal perspective, I'm okay with 5756 as long as paragraph number two is reversed or altered. Because if the parents, if the parents want to know the information about the child, school should be obligated to deliver it. That's it. <laughs> Just before you start. Uh, oh yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just remote support. Okay, okay. just because everybody gets to go. Oh. Hi, I'm Brianna Dominguez, and I live at 2137 South Street. I just turned 14, like. I just turned 14, like three days ago, and school was hard. It was hard when I was in elementary school, and um, this affects my peers, this affects my friends, and when I speak, I speak to my, my teachers because I can't speak to some of the kids. And a lot of people can't speak to their friends, and they can't speak to their parents. And so we speak to our teachers. They, 
because we can't talk to anybody else. And when we can't talk to anybody else and we can only speak to our teachers, then We can only speak to our teachers, and it, if we like go with this, with this, um, fifty six, um, then we can't speak to our teachers and we go to this and we go through this thing then and we don't let the when we tell the parents and we know that we're not comfortable with it then it puts us in a box and puts us in a box that we can't like talk to anybody else and it's really hard because these teachers are our therapists basically when we can't talk to anybody else and we feel comfortable with them and if they just tell our parents then we have no one to talk to This, this is about choice. There will be parents that will open their arms and there will child and there will be parents that won't. And this is what we are worried about. The parents that won't open their arms. Hello, good evening. Um, well, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Chris Noel, N-O-W-E-L-L. I live at 2100 Linwood Ave, and North. Uh, and actually, I'm going to talk about something completely different and hopefully, hopefully not you know, kind of controversial. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, doing a bike bus in Fort Lee. Um, so if you don't know what a bike bus is, yeah, I, I emailed. I emailed. Um, it's uh, where some adults, like parents, and perhaps some community volunteers. Um, Kind of escort students, you know, from the neighborhoods on their bikes and deliver them to their schools, um, and uh, and then they can repeat that on the way home as well. And it could involve uh, perhaps um, a police escort as well. So um, you know, there's so many advantages to this, and it really just kind of like dawned on me uh, when uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. So I'm a substitute teacher in Fort Lee in Leonia. Uh, I was a high school teacher in Dover for ten years. Um, but anyway, coming to school now in my own neighborhood, I noticed these huge lines of cars and, you know, mostly SUVs that are just, uh, it's parents who are there to drop off their kids at school. And Fort is pretty small geographically. I, I walk or ride my bike everywhere. Um, and, you know, the, so this is just adding to the traffic congestion and the air pollution and the general chaos in the mornings. Um, and so, if a bike bus were to kind of catch on, like Montclair does it once uh, once a week, and it's done in other other parts of the country, in Bro Brooklyn, you know, I mean, like we think like, oh, you know, so dense in Fort Lee, well, they can do it in Brooklyn. So, you know, that takes cars off the road, increases exercise for kids, reduces pollution, increases socialization. It just looked like, you know, incredibly fun. But I, I know, I, I emailed Dr. Kravitz and his baker about it, and then uh, Lisa Lee with Easy Ride, Follow up as well. So they're really going to provide a lot of support for arranging one of these. We want to set one up in May, uh, which is you know, uh, National Bike Month. And it doesn't have to be on National Bike to School Day, which is May 8th. But there's an, oh yeah, I was going to mention, you know, a lot of kids want to ride bikes here in Fort Lee. Um, I was at the high school last week and there were 20 bicycles, 20 e scooters, and seven e assist bikes parked outside. And here at the middle school and intermediate school on Friday, there were 10 e-scooters, four bikes, two e-bikes, and one regular scooter, and my bike. 
So, I mean, it's clear that their kids want to ride bikes. When you look at the elementary schools, there's hardly any. So some parents will escort their kids on their bikes to school. But I think that, you know, they're not, well, I mean, you know, today it's very different than when I was young, but I think that they're a little uh, uh, worried, you know, about the safety of their kids going to school on bikes on their own. Um, but I, I've been speaking at Fort Lee Town Council meetings and also the Bergen County Commissioner meetings. Okay, so it was also expressed that this could help Bergen County, stimulate Bergen County to adopt a complete streets policy as well. And the county roads are the most dangerous in Fort Lee. So anything we can do to help with that would help everybody as well. Okay, thank you. Jim Mahalakis, 268 Harmon Avenue. I'm still against this policy. I'm shocked that the, that it came back after we voted against it. There's a lot of parents in Fort Lee who are against this policy, but they're afraid to speak out. So what are options? Homeschooling or bring the kids to Catholic school? So there's so much wrong with the policy. It separated our community and it brought on a culture war. We already have the law against discrimination. We don't require another sub policy because at this point we're marginalizing certain beliefs and lifestyles. There's nothing progressive about certain groups of children having more care and empathy from the school. I grew up in a time where it was just live and let live or just mind your own business. The confidentiality is the beginning of a one sided ideology, which may result in many other policies, curriculums to be exposed and discussed to our children behind our backs. We live in a diverse town where families have different religions and beliefs. The school is looking to be a safe space for transgender students, but what happens at 3.30 when the school premises are vacated or on weekends, holidays, and summer break? We can all pretend the school is a safe space, but there's nothing like a parent's love to guide you through life struggles. That so-called that so-called school confidentiality has taken away the child-parent open relationship. How are we as parents? How can we as parents safely send our children to school, not knowing what happens in the bathroom facilities? My child is a second grader who still believes in princess fairy tales. In the same thought where I voted, where I opted out of sex education, I would like the same respect as a parent to not worry about who my child is going to the bathroom with and what they'll see that they don't already, that I don't allow them to see on movies. The school is taking away the privacy and safety of our children. We have parental rights over what shows and movies our children watch, but the school wants to lie and hide what goes on in school so parents are left in the dark. And to the students who state they're afraid of their parents, the only people who will care for you and suffer for your well-being are your parents. Your parents, your parents are the only ones who will worry for you to come home safe at the end of the day. I too was afraid of my parents when I was a child. But as I grew up, I came to the realization that they just wanted me to be the best version of myself. That's it. I do want to thank you for. I know it's my own decision, but I'm glad that it was. Um, at the same time, we really can't erase what's happened these past few weeks, when we can't really even hear these words that have been said. So, here we go. Um, I'm the mother of a Fort Lee High School freshman who's been in the district since kindergarten. He proudly identifies as gay. So, if you know him, he spoke here in March 4th meeting, telling you his personal story, begging you to keep 5756. He was also here last Wednesday supporting his friend, while they too bravely spoke and pleaded with you not to abolish it. He can be here tonight, but he had a little bit of a friend. Um, we'll see you across the street. 
Um, Hudson, like so many LGBTQ+, wasn't quite sure of his gender identity starting at a young age, as early as elementary school. So yes, elementary school was a soft spot. As parents, we saw this, and many times parents do see this. I know that there are situations where they don't, but if you open your eyes, and you have an open mind, a lot of times you see these harms. Not always. Um, but we made sure that he got nothing but love, so he could be free to explore who he was. He tried sports like Little League and soccer, but after a season or two, he made it clear that it wasn't for him. He we told him that's okay. He'd go to the gap, he'd pick out some clothes from the boy side, and then he'd ask to get some shirts from the girl side because he said that side had prettier clothes. And he told me, sure, that's okay. Through intermediate and middle school, he continued to figure himself out, figure himself out just as kids do. He grew out longer hair, he'd sometimes bring our first to school, which I know he mentioned, and he saw this, so it's on that screen. Um, he sometimes bring a purse to school or wear shirts that were considered more feminine. Wasn't easy for him, kids can be mean, and the comments were not always nice. But he had an inclusive, supportive environment at home and at school within the teachers and counselors who he chose to speak with about. There were days he spoke with his counselor or a trusted teacher, and he'd come home and tell me right away. There were times he'd mention this conversation he had weeks later, and I'm sure he had conversations I was never aware of. And that's okay. Because the whole time Hudson was trying to figure out his identity, no counselor, no teacher, or anyone at school was ever trying to push him to identify a certain way, and they certainly not trying to convert. And again, these are some of the comments we heard. So these accusations against our teachers and school professionals are ridiculous. My son was given empathy, support, and the space to discover his own identity. And for that, I am grateful. Looking back at those years, I cannot imagine if his gender expression triggered a phone call at home or a conversation with a trusted teacher. Um, 5756, as it is, in its entirety, protects the civil rights of gender nonconforming and transgender states of all ages under state and federal law. I had some other things, I'm not going to put it that way, so I do commend you. It does make me nervous still that there's some of you that still might bring this up again. It's just I wanted to get a perspective of a parent or a child who certainly saw, you know, went through this at a young age at the Fort Lee Elementary School. So I felt always support all this as well. Thank you. Uh, John McTiernan, 1045 Anderson Avenue. I've got two girls in the school system here. I had many things that I wanted to say based upon last week's meeting, but I'm very happy with the report happened that uh, they're relatively necessary. But one in particular keeps coming up tonight, and that's a parent's right to know their children. I agree with that 100%. But that's the parent's responsibility Amen. to foster that relationship, not the school. <laughs> If a child comes to a teacher and says they've got a crush on somebody, you don't get a call home. Mm -hmm. If a child says, I like ham sandwiches, not turkey sandwiches, you don't get a call home. <laughs> this shouldn't be the school responsibility of the school to tell the parent what the child is like. That's the responsibility of the parent, the child. Leave it between them. Thank you so much for the vote tonight. With that said, I don't know everybody's name, but to the board member who had um, their, their what was contacted, as somebody who will fight you with every ounce of energy I have, I find what happened disgusting, and as somebody in that community, I Respond to a lot of these comments. You know, no one is saying you can't know if your child is transgender. If you think this is something your child's considering, you ask them. Why do you need to rely on the school to share with you? If you're so concerned, talk to your kids. And if they feel safe talking to you, they will. If you're concerned about the school driving a wedge between the family unit. If you want a secure family unit, make your child feel welcome, open, open the dialogue. <laughs> You need to recognize their autonomy. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christos Kotoyanis, and I'm on the road for the resident. Uh, 
grew up in Fort Lee, graduated from Fort Lee High School, uh, came back to live in Fort Lee to be a student as well. So I've heard people talk about inclusivity, equality, acceptance, and tolerance. And yet I've witnessed and we've witnessed by those same people some, some of the most underhanded, cruel attacks against people who not only think differently, but voice those concerns. What I've witnessed and experienced is both appalling and disheartening. This is not, this is not about personal identity. Everyone has that right. This is about the fundamental principle that underpins the very fabric of our society. The unbreakable right of parents to direct and oversee the upbringing of their children. Actually, we're talking about children as young as six. This principle is not just a cultural norm. It's a constitutional guarantee protected under the due process clause of the 14th amendment. The right to due process is there for a reason. It's not merely a procedural formality, it's a buffer against unwarranted intrusion into the sanctity of the family. It ensures that any action that may affect the parent's right to the care, custody, and control of their child is subject to the highest scrutiny. This is because the framers of our Constitution recognize the family as the primary nurturing force of American life, not the state. They understood that the parent's role is a paramount is paramount in protecting and guiding their children, not just in matters of education, faith, or health, but in all aspects of life. The family is the cornerstone of American life. It's within the family that values are passed down, that character and integrity is formed, and where children are nurtured into the citizens who will shape our future. And as a proud parent of three beautiful souls, I bear that responsibility with love, with dedication and a solid commitment to their safety and prosperity, and I will die for them. Yet once again, we find ourselves face to face with a rule that undermines this fundamental right. Rule 5756, as I've heard here, is a place to protect children. But in reality, it's sidelining those who have their best interest at heart, their parents. Let's be clear here. The state, despite all its resources and authority, cannot replace the unique role that a parent plays in a child's life. It's the parent who loves unconditionally, who sacrifices without hesitation, and protects with fierce determination. The bond between a parent and a child is unparalleled, and the, in, in, and the intuition of a parent for their child's welfare is unmatched. To keep parents in the dark only about their child's sexual identity under the pretext of protecting them is wrong and a great disservice to the very children this policy claims to protect the family. It's the parent who'll stand up in the dead of night to soothe a nightmare, who'll work tirelessly to provide opportunities for growth and learning, and who'll fight against any harm that threatens their child. The state's role should be to support and empower parents in this mission, not to replace it. No, you got it. We lost, so I'm going to speak. In fact, Sarah, it's I'm you, Sarah, I'd ask you to finish your thought, please. What? Just wrap up your thought, please. Yeah, I'm wrapping up right now. Thank you. In fact, if you don't repeal, you're substituting the family with the transit opinions of any stranger holding a degree. Make the right choice. You did it. This is about the kind of society we want to build for generations to come. Let's prioritize the values and roles to hold our community together. And I'd like to just end, I was gonna end with something else, but I'd like to end that the parents, the, the board members that ran on parental rights, I've never been involved politically, but I can't wait till the next election comes. Firstly, my name is Stephanie Cotigliani, I'm on Tom Hunter Road. I'm a, I'm a gender non-conforming biological female who believes sex-based rights are essential to human rights. And that puberty, is a human right, a human right, puberty. I have been filmed through this whole thing by someone sitting in the back, harassing, saying shut the F up every two minutes to people that are speaking up here. I think it shows the mental health of the people pushing this on the children. I think it shows uh, that we have really deviant older people pushing an agenda on children, an agenda that has no basis in reality. Yeah. <laughs> That's 
through. 41% of LGBTQ young people seriously consider attempting suicide in the past year, including half of the transgender and non-binary people and nearly three in 10 normal average everyday male and females. 14% of LGBTQ young people attempt suicide. That's nearly one in five transgender. Among this community, ages 13 to 17, two to five think of suicide, one to five attempt suicide, four out of five want mental health with a family member. All science shows that a child, a child, needs their parent and a medical health professional when dealing with gender dysphoria. No one in this school is qualified to deal with it. You are going to get sued. It's just a matter of when. And the absolute vitriol that has been said about my family my children, I didn't even know who Moms for Liberty was that they were putting out there, but I will make this one last statement. The word transphobic as used here does not mean an irrational fear or dislike of trans people. It means refusing to use gender identity ideology jargon, refusing to parrot its slogans, refusing to accept that sex doesn't matter when it comes to sports and single sex spaces, refusing to believe a bearded heterosexual man becomes a lesbian when he declares himself one, and refusing to believe an abusive, misogynistic male is a woman because he likes to wear mini dresses and pout on Facebook. J.K. Rawlings wrote those words. She's been called a trans exclusionary radical feminist. If she's one, then so am I, because I believe that women have a right to safe spaces without men in them, period, females. And I'm not letting my daughter share any space with any male, and I thank God that the NAACP is taking up the issue because women's seat thank at the you. table are Miss, getting taken yes. by men. Miss, thank you. Hi, my name is Candace, and I'm at 427 Westview Place with two kids in the system, or and one kid in the system, one. Um, I thank you for your vote to rescind the repeal of 5756. Today I have the pleasure of reading a letter from a Fort Lee high schooler who, despite the despicable accusations that these letters are fake or coerced, is asking for this to be read out to all of you as they are the ones that this policy affects. This message goes out to parents at this meeting whose children may be closeted in fear of being put in danger for coming out and to parents who are afraid of the world, as I am a product of both, constantly living in the shadows to shelter myself from the potential wrath of my parents. When your child comes out to you as gay or trans, don't tell them that you love them no matter what. Of course you do. But that's what you say to a child who's done something wrong and, does, and didn't meet your expectations. It's what you say when they've been caught stealing a candy bar or cheating on a test. Instead, Maybe convey something that tells your child there's nothing wrong with being LGBTQ+. If you truly love them so much, convey to them that they are safe, secure, valid, and protected by their parents, not creating a space where your child has to walk on eggshells at the mere topic of sexuality and orientation. This harbors the so-called secrecy your child feels needs to be implemented within your relationship to feel like they are out of harm's way. It's not the fault of the district that your role as a parent isn't being met or that your child finds security in trusted adults who aren't you. Instead, please tell them everything I learn about you makes me love you more. 
I find I, I love finding out who you are, and I'm so excited for the world to do the same. It may be a complete readjustment to how you see your child. Trust me, they've been thinking about it for months, maybe even years. As a parent, you may need time to catch up, but it doesn't mean you should love them any less. And do not tell your children that you are afraid life will be harder for them. It's not your children's responsibility to carry the weight of your fears. They'll be plenty capable of discovering fears on their own, as any productive member of society would. That's life. Let your children live. They don't need your fears too. All we want to all we want is to seek acceptance. When a child comes out, the only emotion you need to express is joy. That's their letter. Um, I did want to add, just because I have a little bit more time, I'm grateful that I had the privilege to read this letter on this day that six of you recognized with your vote that this is not a policy with the aim to keep secrets from parents and that you hear this child and their peers. Again, this policy is a guideline for schools as to how to adhere to the New Jersey law against discrimination and continue to provide a safe space for all children to learn. Like I said last week, nice, I, I, as a teacher, I'd really prefer to just say, nice necklace to me, come to the rug for now. Your beloved 3319 is far more involved. Thank you again for your vote and please continue to keep me safe. Good evening, Annabella, one executive drive, one child in the district, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I just want to express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to the six board members that took the actions that they did, that voted and abstained to get us off this crazy freight train that we've all been on um, for the last two weeks. Uh, I also want to thank you because that means I don't have to read my original speech and be up here for the full three minutes, but I do want to include um, a part of it, and it's a, a fun historical fact that you may or may not know. The very first department slash board of education was established in 1867, making the nine of you a part of a legacy that is 157 years old. Um, I think that's quite cool. However, unfortunately, boards of education throughout American history have often voted on the wrong side of history. None so evident as when they wanted to keep uh, schools set racially segregated in the 50s, for example. And just with that legacy, I hope that we can all in this room, all of us remind ourselves that despite our own personal views, human beings evolve the world is in a constant state of change. Societal norms evolve. What we think we know evolves all the time. And that forward thinking is what we need to ensure our utmost survival. Please do not roll forwardly backwards. Let's think forward and work together. You know, stay off this crazy freight train. I mean, for a while there, I felt like I was in the backseat of Thelma and Louise's car, you know, at the end of the movie when Gina Davis is like, let's just keep going. Um, anyway, too soon for humor. Thank you so much. Really, thank you. Peace. Just happened to walk in and uh, was listening in at home a little bit because I was working late. Um, I, I just want to say it's, a, it's astonishing. I'm sorry, can you just state your name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. Right? My name is Constantine Raku. I live on 244 Miguel Avenue. You know, it's astonishing to me that we have to discuss fight for parental rights because I think that is what the issue is at hand, in my opinion. I, you know, I don't think for me it's a lesbian, gay, or LGBTQ right issue at this stage. For me, it's parental rights. I think God has bestowed me and given me, well, has blessed me to have children. And my wife and I have raised two children through the Fort Lee school system. I'm a product of the Fort Lee school system. And to me, I think it's, it's something that I, I just can't stand the idea of the parent not having the final word on what happens to their own child. Now, everyone voted here, those six people we keep talking about. I don't know who they were. All I'm saying is that 
they cannot be the end goal of my child or anyone's child for that matter. God has given me the ability, he's trusted me to raise my child. And now I have to come to a point where I can only take it nine tenths of the way or eight tenths or seven, because it's gonna be now, it's maybe nine tenths, tomorrow it could be seven tenths. At some point, I may not even have a say in what happens to a child. And I think that's the road, the slippery slope that we're on here. You know, everyone voted to have everyone to, you know, for, for people to, for parents not to know or protect the child from the parent, which is astonishing again to me, I keep using that word. You know, what would happen if the roles were reversed? What would happen if a child who was being raised happily gay got confused and decided to seek protection from his parents who raised them gay? And came to you all and said, hey, I want to be straight. Are you going to keep that from the parents? Thank you. Hello, Board of Ed members. My name is Amir Call. I live at one executive track in Portland, New Jersey, and I'm a junior at Portland High School. I moved here with my mom after 12 years of growing up in Cliffside Park, and first and foremost, I want to thank this town and all board members for welcoming me and my mom into this community. From the moment I met my classmates, the school staff, and the marching band, I knew that moving to this town was the right decision. And that opinion has stood for over two years now, absolutely unchallenged. The wonderful minds I have met and continue to meet in this town are also diverse and sensible in their perspectives. It makes me feel like moving here almost moved me to the future at the same time. So I hope you can imagine how distraught I was when I learned of the issue at hand. How policy 5756 was to be mangled and Frankensteined into a new policy which puts into question the job of the Board of Education and puts certain children in danger, especially at a time when my physics teacher, whom I am very grateful for, had to be pulled out of retirement to fulfill my educational needs due to the current teacher shortage. As a child, I admit it's hard for me to see eye to eye with the many experienced parents sitting in front of me. But I know you all understand the importance of a child growing up in a safe and caring environment, and I understand that as parents, you are concerned about all there is to know about your child. But I must urge you to reevaluate the root of your concerns, because if it were about children growing up safe and, and uh, cared for, there are far more pressing matters you could have chosen to address instead, like the teacher shortage. The vote tonight to maintain policy 5756 was incredible, and I give my deepest gratitude to the board. But I still worry. I worry because this should not be a matter of politics. It's a matter of civil rights. I feel the need to inform the board that the changes suggested in policy 3319 fall in line with the parental rights movement, which is a GOP-centered cause spearheaded by extremist groups. I urge the board to ensure that the decisions they make from here on out are not influenced by political pressure, as is mandated by the sixth code of the Board of Education Code of Ethics. I wish that the board would continue to hear and accept the demands of their students who, for the last two weeks and counting, have been writing and speaking and writing and speaking again to keep policy 5756 as is. <laughs> Lastly, I urge the board to think critically of how they will be viewed five or ten years from now when the tide of time lowers and reveals the correct side of history. I hope that the board continues to make decisions that will define this town as one that will bellow in the face of backwards change. Because after getting to know this town, I realize that if you choose wrong, those at the true heart of this community will not follow you back in time. Thank you. I live at 1018 Jasmine Way. So I have to confess, I think what happened here tonight is confusing for many reasons. I'm glad the votes that happened earlier went the way they did, and I thank the board for that action. I think we have to remember what has happened so we don't repeat this process again. I hope that we never again are in a situation where the board moves to take action in so hasty and unconsidered a manner. To me, the most concerning thing about this process has been the lack of consideration being given to students find themselves in danger without the protections of policy 5756. 
because sadly, not all parents are as supportive as we all would hope they would be. I think the key here is to listen to what the students have told us in the last few weeks through statements and letters. Please don't do this again and make students fear for their safety again. Please leave 5756 in place and do not refresh the black eye on our tent. Thank you. Good evening. Brian Drumgold, 9 Drury Lane, Fort Lee. As a parent with two kids in the school system, I ask and I beg that you all be united. Please come to, together, emphasize together, to address the various topics before you and can continue to build upon the great work that you have all done in the past. We all know what you can do in the future when you are together, alongside our great superintendent, his administration, and every member of this education and school system. I know that each and every one of you care and love this community. But when we are together, we are Fort Lee. President Richter, knowing firsthand what you endured the last 48 hours, for you to be able to be here this evening shows how strong of a woman you are, yes. your commitment to this community, to the children and the parents, and most definitely highlighted your leadership skills. Thank you to each and every one of you for your service, and together we will be for me. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ruggiero. Oh, we have one more person. If there's anyone else out there in the audience who wants to speak, please just stand up so we know. Thank you. Sorry. Sweet. My name is Claire Patterson. I live on Warwick County. I have a daughter who lives here. I do want to thank you for the vote. Um, I was absolutely shocked when I heard what had happened in the recent weeks, and I'm pleased that that was resolved. I don't actually want to talk about that particular policy, though. I want to bring up the fact that I, sh I don't think we should have people who are not residents of the town speaking for meetings. I think that a lot of the fear and politics that happened around this meeting happened because we felt political groups were coming in to represent their agenda. And any parent here who disagrees with me, I have no problem, of course, with them speaking. Anyone who's a resident who has an opinion, to share their opinion. And that way, the opinions that are heard here reflect the community opinions which I think is what the board wants to hear. So um, with respect to everyone who had the courage to come up and speak, especially the kids who are very inspiring, I just want to say I think the board should consider looking at their public speech policy and ensuring that the people who get to speak are residents. Thank you. I'm Mickey Linwood Park. I'm a proud transgender man who is a strong advocate for the transgender community. I sit on three different executive boards organizing transgender conferences throughout New Jersey. I oversee several teenage transgender support groups. I run a support group for parents of transgender children. Um, and I sponsor other transgender men who are living states that can't get surgery. I'm not an expert on transgender issues, but I'm more aware of the struggles of the transgender issues that probably, than probably anyone else in this room. So I hope you will listen with an open mind. Casey and Paula are proposing to only change one section. Schools being allowed to keep separate records from the parents of kindergarten to fifth grade only does not affect high schoolers. They're not proposing to out anyone they're not taking away anyone's rights. They're giving parents rights. So a lot of you are misinformed who are getting up here speaking about maybe being out into your parents. A parent brought the child into the world, raised and nurtured that, nurtured that child. Now the school system wants those parents to hand over their five-year-old child to school staff who are not trained on transgender issues to keep secrets from the parents. 
5657 is not mandatory. Many schools in New Jersey, many schools are in the process of repealing 5756. Nobody is perfect. Parents, teachers, school staff. So you can't say teachers are better to raise a child over their parents. You cannot take away parents' rights for children five to 10 years old. I would appreciate it if you disagree with my opinion or question, have any questions, have the guts to talk to me face to face. Don't hide behind your computers when you get home tonight and bash my name all over and attack me on social media. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ruggiero? Yes, Howard Livoff. You've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Howard Lipoff. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank the um, uh, business administrator for her very interesting <clears throat> presentation tonight on the budget. I do think that I somewhat disagree with her perspective. She voiced regret that we, um, although we got uh, an increase in state aid, it wasn't enough. Well, yeah, we always wish for more, but this is the first time that I could remember uh, the state um, formula for funding public schools has been fully met. And it's an increase, and I think that's positive. And I also think um, that the vote taken earlier tonight was a positive thing as well. Um, let me ask about the budget. Um, will the summer bridge program be funded this year? So that's one question I have. The other question I have, and I asked it um, at the last board meeting, and I didn't get an answer. Um, there was, after having that um poorly thought out idea of repealing that policy on transgender uh, youth, the same uh, board majority voted against professional development for, I, I think it's new teachers, to explore the principles of culturally responsive teaching. As I said, there was no answer to that question. The, uh, by members of the board. The only comment was from a former board member who came to the microphone and said she noticed that the presenter um, uh, on his social media account had a rainbow flag, a, a gay pride flag, I guess, um, behind him. And that, that becomes very troubling that we're forced to conclude that maybe the board is taking a discriminatory stance on people who come and work in any capacity for the uh, Fort Lee Public Schools. I'd like that addressed because with our current shortage of teachers, our shortage of education support professionals, I have a feeling that if word gets out that this board will discriminate, even if there is a um, recommendation from the uh, the superintendent that that will have a negative effect of getting people to come in and work in the Fort Lee public schools. It could also have a chilling effect because maybe some of the administrators will not recommend some of these people to work in our schools because they're afraid the board majority will vote against them for discriminatory reasons. Uh, so I'd like responses to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. thank you for your questions. As far as the Center Bridge program, uh, as of now, we will not be running that program. Thank you. And then, again, as you know, it's public comments. You're welcome to get in. Not all comments can, can uh, response. Kajay Kesha, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. 
Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Saya Shesia or Sarah, and I live at 484 Main Street. My child is attending public schools in Fort Lee. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, now, first of all, I wanted to bring to the attention of Mr. Kravitz and the others that we should be uh, following the rules. And people that have nothing to do with our public schools, like they're not parents, neither are they students, they shouldn't be attending. It's time taking, nerve consuming to hear their feelings about different agendas. Um, I personally don't, don't, I'm not part of any political groups or any religious groups. I'm a free person who have chosen to uh, submit myself to the power of the Almighty Lord. Now I have noticed, and I have brought it to your attention, and this is probably the last time that I'm bringing it to your attention, that our children are, um, um, uh, uh, we as parents have our rights to protect, care, and provide for our children. And we need our rights to stay in place for those children that, or those parents, or those teachers that feel that they are discriminated based upon their, um, how they feel about their gender or uh, based of a race or a color. And we always have the institutions as corrupt as they are, like child protection services, child abuse hotline, our corrupted Fort Lee police and others. Report, report, and report no matter what. So everyone is protected at some point. We have our institutions. We don't need to bring 56 and 57. Now, um, we already ha have our conditions in our schools that are so poor. We walk into the bathrooms there and it's like you're gonna get a urinary tract infection pandemics because they smell so bad. The bro broken sidewalks, the gravel all over the, the grounds that can get to the children's eyes and, and all of that. So we already, you already are having the um, uh, violations of Title II C of criminal codes for New Jersey. And we're not pushing ourselves to go into the extreme of following up any lawsuits at this point in time. But you want to add the 56 and 57, and they have an um, underneath agenda on, on their own because they already we already have the institutions in USA against discrimination, as I said. That is like dragging ourselves and dragging our children into the mud and darkness. Meanwhile, that we're deviating them so far, um, our enemy has penetrated our government to the point that our leaders start from our president to the others who are leading our schools and communities are simply thieves that are stealing our tax money and funding wars on innocent people. I do a last blasting call to all the parents to get together and do a last blasting call to the Fort Lee Board of Education to stand up against 56 and 57 and release and free our children and our parents and give them full rights. Thank you for your attention and have a good night. FB.com groups, you've been promoted to panelists. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Kyla Deneen. Uh, I'm actually an old virgin. I see everyone's getting tired, so I'll try to be brief. Um, good evening, Fort Lee, and congratulations on your decision to uphold 5756 and the vital protections it provides. <laughs> Board, there were so many courageous speakers this evening, including brave students, and your district is fortunate to have such incredible people come out to this meeting. <clears throat> Again, I'm Kyla Deneen. I represent NJ Voters for Church and State Separation. You can find us on Facebook, NJ Voters for Church and State Separation. And I just wanted to say that overall, this policy is a beacon of progress, ensuring that transgender students are afforded the same rights and protections as are all other students within our New Jersey schools. It is a clear statement that our commitment to equality transcends any singular belief system and that our public policies must reflect the diverse society we live in. Policy 5756 is not about upholding the rights of quote unquote, just a few, as some have tried to claim. Rather, it's a reflection of our broader commitment to civil rights and the non-discrimination principles that are woven into the fabric of our nation. To the extent to which they are not already, the protections this policy affords will be codified into state law one day. 
History will not remember fondly, if it is to remember at all, those who sought to subject their neighbor's children to discrimination and harassment. You can try to claim that attempting to decimate this policy doesn't mean that you don't care about the safety of LGBTQ students, but nobody who actually does care about them believes you, least of all younger people like me. I hope your district never again has board members who attempt to subject LGBTQ students to the potential for harm, because Fort Lee, you have allies this evening from all across the state. Unrelenting allies who will continue to show up if ever and whenever you and your loved ones are targeted. For this, we ask for you to return the favor to help others in towns like mine who need support to battle against bigots who want to take us backwards. Because no matter who or where in this state we are, we are stronger together. But thank you again, Fort Lee board members. Christian Lasval, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Christian? Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Lasval. I'm a former Fort Lee public school student and my family has lived in Fort Lee for about 20 years. I'm here to condemn the vote to rescind the repeal of policy 5756. Both 5756 and 3319 violate parental rights as well as Fort Lee School's safe and inclusive environments. It is, it is my sincere hope that the board, especially those who ran on protecting parental rights and removing gender ideology from our public schools, but failed their community tonight, will have the courage to correct their catastrophic error and repeal the policy in its entirety. Many of the ideas expressed by both sides of this argument are frankly and unfortunately irreconcilable. There can be no compromise between them. One idea prevailing necessarily means that another will not. Some ideas are right, others are wrong. That's ultimately at the root of tonight's debate and this board will have to make the difficult decisions of either enabling delusions or protecting reality and sanity in our community policies. For all of American history, schools have been understood to be a partnership between parents and teachers where teachers educate children with the informed consent of their parents. Why? because children belong to their parents and parents are children's primary educators, not the schools or school teachers. <laughs> 5756 violates the primary role of parents in their children's lives and over a century of established American law by removing parents from the equation and allowing teachers to enable life altering social transitions without parental knowledge or consent. In their youngest years, children's minds and emotional development are easily influenced. In their teenage years, children face all sorts of identity questions as they seriously begin to figure out the kind of person they're going to be. When it comes to questions of gender, it is the parents' job to raise their boys as boys and their girls as girls. While some, while some may neglect to do so, it is certainly not the job of teachers to hide a child's gender dysphoria from their parents. All available research tells us that anywhere from 80 to 95% of preteens and teens who are not socially transitioned when they first express gender dysphoria will return to identifying with their biological sex after their adolescence. There is nothing safe. There is nothing safe about enabling a child's confusion about their gender when in nine out of 10 cases, their gender dysphoria resolves itself with time. A safe school environment is one in which parents know what's going on with their children everything that's going on with their children. A safe school environment is one that doesn't jeopardize girls' athletic achievements by making them compete against boys. A safe school environment is one that doesn't allow boys to be in girls' locker rooms and vice versa. An inclusive school environment is one in which parents are included in the process of their children's education and have the most influential voice in directing it because children belong to their parents first. We don't love those with gender dysphoria by enabling it. We love them by helping them reconcile their identity with their biological sex. Oh. Policy 5756 oh. yeah. yeah. five, five, and 3319 and any other versions that may come up only serve to exacerbate a child's gender dysphoria and removes them from the ones with whom they are often the same. Sir, sir you can just wrap up your comment. Until policy 5756 and all of its other forms should be repealed in their entirety. <laughs> 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 
Naomi Bajovic, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Naomi, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, let me just start the video. I am the mother of two children. My name is Naomi Bojovic. I reside in 2337 Hudson Terrace in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Um, it's appalling to me that from the moment of conception, I've been tasked with taking care of children, feeding them, taking care of them emotionally and physically. From the moment of their birth, I've been tasked with making sure that they are safe. Anything from falling down to wiping away their tears, anytime they are involved in anything, where it might be a fight in school or just an emotional stress of some sort. It's appalling to see that now as I'm getting ready to bring my children into the schooling system, I'm now being tasked with even questioning that these educators will be possibly influencing them to do something that religiously I'm not for. And secondly, apart from religiously, something that they do not have the right to do. I was given God-given authority over my children to be their parents. Their parents. <laughs> Aside from having God Almighty as my highest authority, Secondly, I was given the constitutional right, which protects us and our parental rights to protect our children against from what we're seeing today. If we hear the comments that were made tonight, our children's choices and our parental rights were being compared to something as crazy as ordering a tuna sandwich at school. Come on, guys. We need to do better by our kids. We need to do better by the parents of this town. And generally, as a society as a whole, we need to make sure that parental rights are in place. If a child is not able to speak to their parents, has no place in school to, for them to fill the need of the parent. We need to figure out other counseling or other means or other reasons. That's all. Bob, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Bob. You mute. Hey guys, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. <clears throat> hey everyone. Uh, my name is Bob. I live on Bridge Plaza North Fort Lee. I have a few kids here in the school system. Uh, some of me, uh, some of you know me from coaching your kids and baseball and football. And I love being part of this community. Uh, thanks for your time. I was at the meeting last week. I did not speak because I wanted to just uh, sit there and take it all in and listen to everybody's point of view. Uh, there's a lot of emotion coming from both sides, which is understandable. Both sides feel like they're going to lose something, whether this policy stays in place or is taken off the table. Uh, much respect to those raising your concerns on both sides of the issue without fear mongering and calling people extremists and bigots and all that stuff. Um, three minute windows don't really allow us to have discussions, but just bullet point conversations, you know, uh, but a question, if you were to send out flyers to all the parents of this community to see if they would waiver or give up any rights to their child for any policy, LGBTQ aside, what answer do you think you would get? Remember, these are the parents of the Board of Age Education members represent. What do you think the consensus would be? This is, uh, most parents are not, uh, not concerned with this LGBTQ stuff. They're concerned of the barrier that being placed between the school system and our young kids in our, in our, in our homes. Once you, once you put that barrier between us, we're going to put a barrier between you and the teacher, us and the teacher, us and the superintendent, us and the board of education. Transparency has not been your biggest asset in this school system. So look, we're all here for our community. We love the community we live in, right? I, I coach these kids. I spend thousands of dollars and hours over the several years I've been here. Fort Lee is a, a very inclusive town. And people just say, oh, I'm ashamed of this town that I moved here. There's bigots. That's, that's nonsense. There's nobody hunting down for any LGBTQ reasons on a street. That's ridiculous. This is a very loving community. Policemen, firemen. Council members, parents, they donate all their time to help these kids in sports and other programs. This amounts of money and effort and time of their companies to help these kids. But now 
placing this one little barrier will hurt that fabric of this community. Parental rights come first, no matter what, especially for junior high level and down. These kids need to talk to their parents. Parents need to be involved with their kids and teachers and board of education and superintendent. To, to say that you can make a file that where I can't I can't review it because my seven year old wants to uh, wants to disclose something to you. My seven year old thought a black hole was going to open up in his room the other night and wouldn't go to sleep because he watched a video on black holes. What What do you think is going through these kids' minds? It's us as parents to guide them. We don't send our kids. Now, we don't birth our kids, feed our kids, and send them to school. They're our kids, not the state's kids, not Fort Lee's kids. They're not the federal government's kids. They're our kids. We raise them. Alex W., you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Alex W. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex. I live at 2454 Second Street. Uh, I'm an educator myself, and uh, repetition is definitely one of the keys to learning. So let me repeat something that has been said already. This policy does not create a barrier between parents and their children. If you, if you want to know something about your child, all you have to do is ask them. Do you want to know if your child is transgender? Ask them. Do you want to know if your child is gay? Ask them. If they don't tell you, then that's probably because they don't want to. And if they don't want to, maybe you should ask yourself why they don't want to. The policy starts. The policy does not create barriers between parents and their children. I also wanted to uh, comment on the, the reference to the constitutionality of parents' rights. Um, I feel like it's apropos that a previous speaker spoke of the framers of the Constitution and what they wrote about children. And what I've heard from a lot of people is this idea that children belong to their parents, that children are the property of their parents. Well, you know, the framers of the Constitution also believed that there was another group of people that they could treat as property. And those were, of course, I'm talking about the forcibly imported millions of Africans who served in this country as enslaved people. Oh, now, tell me, do we want to go back to a time when all we learn about the framers of the Constitution is that they never told a lie and that they were wonderful people and that they only had the best interest and that all men are created equal? Or do we want to learn the truth that many of them owned slaves? Many of them did not mean the words that they wrote, all men are created equal. We know that's true. The people here who are arguing for parents' rights and who are arguing that children should be the property of their parents, this is a right-wing movement that is intending to ultimately destroy public education. And the first thing they wanna do is take us back to a time when all we learned was to be patriotic, uh, to support the USA no matter what. We learned lies about the presidents. We learned lies about many things. Is that what we want to go back to? Is that what we want Fort Lee to be? I, I certainly don't. And I know that there are many, many parents in this town who may have questions, who may have uncertainties about this policy. But I feel like they are certain that they want their kids to learn the truth. Moms for Liberty wants your kids to learn lies, and it starts here. Thank you. Sharon Kwa Lee, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Sharon Kwa Lee. You're muted, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is my okay. first time doing this, sorry about that. We can hear I you. don't wanna speak long because I know that it's been way too long. It's been, um, this conversation has been going on way too long and I know there has been a vote already. 
I would like first to thank each and every BOE member. No matter what your opinions are, I respect the fact that you all are there to serve our children and our students. Um, I understand parental rights. I believe in parental rights. However, what has been going on tonight, which is really frustrating, is that I feel that people did not actually read the actual policy. And I will read through some of them um, where for parental rights and every single person who spoke about their concern with parental rights, it's right there. It's in the policy. It's in 5756. It's even in the revised proposal, which I read both of them. Read every single word, please. I, everybody who has concerns, because it actually did say policy five, well, five, seven, five, six. Number three, school districts may seek a variety of professionals, including counselors and school psychologists to provide emotional support. So anybody that had concerns about getting mental health professionals, it's right there. Number four, confidentiality and privacy. The counseling for student and students family be facilitated in any safety issues, in any uh, issues of harassment and bullying. H-1B policy actually demands that parents be told about all this. I don't understand why parental rights becoming an issue when it shouldn't be. 5756 protects parental rights. It protects both sides of us. We need to come together. We do not need lies. We do not need We do not need misrepresentation. And that is what is happening tonight. And that is what has been happening for a long time now. We need to actually read the policy. Figure out a way. When somebody said there is no compromise, causing division by saying that. We do need to compromise. We all need to figure this out. But the way to do it is to listen to each other and to actually read the policy. That is what I urge every person who has concerns. Read the policy. Your parental rights are protected in 5756. JPF, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. JPF. Hey, good evening. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people are on the line tonight? There's 130. Amazing. Great. Hi, everyone. Jay Perinetta Freed here. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, and I'm a resident of One Wall Street. I'm a parent to a first grade child in the district. I'm married to a man who is a public school educator and I'm gay. Still gay for those of you still keeping track <laughs> every single time that I come out to this group of people. Uh, why am I coming out to you again tonight? Because I must. I do it because I'm reminding all the people tuning in tonight, young and old, that coming out as personal and lifelong self-identifying as a member of the LGBTQ community is not a linear path. It's deeply personal, it's convoluted, it's lifelong. I still am, and I will always be gay. <laughs> and I will tell you this, that it's not always easy. We are always othered by more times than we care to admit, but that doesn't mean that we don't hold value and worth because you are worth it. Even after this meeting's conclusion, I will go back to my life as a gay man and can con continue to fight the fight of being seen as an equal member of this country, this county, and this community. During the emergency meeting, I, along with many community members, pleaded for you to reconsider the repeal of 5756. Tonight, you made the right choice. But just know this, the members of the LGBT community are now viscerally aware of how you, the elected members of the Board of Education, move. We see you move. You proclaim love is love is love is love and display rainbow backgrounds on your public platforms, but only for Pride Month? I encourage you to do it more than just to be social media ready with your support. Speak out when you hear homophobia happen in everyday life. Don't tolerate hateful speeches. Call it out. 
Listen to the LGBTQ youth and ask them what they need. Yes, they are young, but also, yes, they are brave. They're full of ideas of how to combat homophobia in a meaningful way. And I sincerely hope that you continue listening to them. They asked you to listen. We asked you to listen. And we're satisfied that you did. You did right. So keep doing right. Thank you all. Ella Bruder, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. We state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Ella Bruder, you're muted. Ala Bruder, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So my name is Ala Bruder. My address is 555 North Avenue. I'm a 31 years resident of Fort Lee, and I'm also a retired Fort Lee public schools teacher. For 15 years, I work as a speech and language specialist in school number one. And in all years that I worked there, I never witnessed any incidents of discrimination of students based on their race, culture, religion, abilities, or sexual orientation. I just want to emphasize how big is the role of parents in raising their children in our district. Since I was a part of special services, my colleagues and I had to constantly collaborate with the parents. Parents were essential members of the IP team and none of our students could achieve success without their parents. Some parents were very difficult to deal with. Some of them were in denial of their child's problem. But with continuous counseling, providing resources to them, and just talking to them face to face, we had achieved tremendous success for their children. I can say that I, as a professional, could not have done my job without parental involvement, and I work with the most vulnerable population. We can't take away rights to care for their children from the parents who, for the most part, are very loving and supporting. We should provide necessary resources and counseling for the parents on such difficult and delicate topics such as gender identity. If you keep this policy in place, it should be definitely revised, and instead of limiting parental rights, broaden them by giving them the necessary tools and resources. This will increase their responsibilities in creating a safe environment for their children at home. The thing that everyone is emphasizing that they don't have, many of these children don't have the safe environment. So give them the tools how to do it. If a student, especially a young one, is afraid to talk about their gender identity to the parents and then comes to school and confides to the teacher and the teacher keeps it a secret from the parents, what good would it do to the child? At school, the child will use his preferred gender identity, but then will come home after school, what, to be another person? Won't this create psychological and mental problems and develop something like a personality disorder, I can't even list all the harmful effects of such approach. Instead, the school should follow, this is my opinion, it's not that I'm telling somebody, it's my opinion. The school should have a protocol in place, just we have an anti-bullying protocol of what to do if such situations occur. If the child talks to the teacher, then the teacher should contact trained professional who then should contact the parents and bring them to the table. And only together they could decide what to do in their child's best interest. There should be people in the district trained in this area so they can counsel the parents. Okay, I will wrap it up. If it's the parents, not this, just the school who care and provide for their child that they love. Are the schools and the community ready to take all parental responsibilities upon themselves? In the best interest of our children, I encourage the board members to give a big thought about this policy and revise it and make appropriate changes, particularly you. when it Thank concerns you young comments. students. I want to say one more sentence. You, you one board more board sentence, board. please. I strongly Maybe. believe that using threatening and insulting tactics and your opponents are not the way to go in democratic society. Thank you.
Mihail, Mihail, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Mihail. Uh, hi, Mihail Komanesko, uh, crazy at Tom Hunter Road, as we heard it last time on the camera. Yeah, I heard it. You yeah. whispered your microphone was on, and we deserve an apology on that one. Uh, in regards to this policy, this policy has no place to exist in the school district because uh, the parents that don't want to be in their children's life and don't care what happens to the kid and they want the kid to talk with whatever stranger, they can perfectly neglect the kid without the policy in place. For everyone else that has a kid, we see what, what's happening on TikTok. Kids eat type pods and they put challenges. Kids uh, put stupid challenges and punching random people. Overall, kids cannot be trusted even with their laundry. And you're telling me that they're gonna be trusted with random talk with random people. Um, so with that in mind, I think as, as a parents, we're fully in our right to be involved in what's happening in school and in which direction the school takes the conversation, especially when other people talk with our kids, because as you know, kids are highly influential and they can be modeled to whatever the parents or the teacher combine uh, push them into. So that's one thing. The other thing is one of the people on stream mentioned that uh, there's actually a cat in the school and the school provided accommodations for that said person, uh, meaning they gave them a litter box at the bathroom. So we're beyond the girl, boy, dress, whatever thing. We're having animals. So my question for the school is how many kids identify as animals and how accommodations for these kids look like? Are you allowing them to lick their genitals in class? Cause that's what the cats do randomly. Do you call animal services when they get sick or you send them to the nurse? The other question is, you know, I have a kid that identifies as Spider-Man cause he's a pre-K. Are you gonna, I don't know, weave in webs and put them on the walls so he could jump around? Cause that's what he thinks nowadays. So but please answer how many cats do we have at this moment in the school district? Because I'm curious about that one. And also, are the parents notified? And or is it the policy 5756 that prevents you from doing that? There are no cats that we are aware of. <laughs> Deborah Masters, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Deborah Masters. Hello, my name is Deborah Masters. I live at 1018 Jasmine Way in Fort Lee. Uh, I'd like to thank the board for their vote earlier this uh, this evening. And uh, But in case we revisit this issue, which is uh, very likely, I'd like to make the following comments. Giving vulnerable children as many options as possible to be able to confide in a responsible and caring adult can only be viewed as positive. Sadly, it's unrealistic to assume that all children come from safe and nurturing homes. Policy 5756 provides protections and options for those children who may need them, and any reduction in those protections is, protections is unacceptable. I urge you to keep policy 5756 in place as is. Please put the needs of vulnerable children first. Kindness and understanding should be in the forefront of our minds when making decisions concerning the welfare of children. Thank you. Esther Hans Silver, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Okay, hello. Um, I would be there with you tonight, but I am homesick with the flu, so I could not be there in person. Um, one of the things that I, I notice people keep saying is, you know, like, oh, you should only listen to the parents. I just want to clarify, the Board of Education represents the community. 
All right. The parents are obviously a segment of the community. I'm not saying that they should be ignored, but I'm just clarifying that they're not the only voice that matters when it comes to decisions like this. Um, I do want it to clarify um, is one P one POL is still on the agenda, right? I don't think there was any motion regarding one POL on tonight's agenda. All right. You can finish your answer. Okay. All right. So if, if it's still on the agenda, I would say someone should make a motion to strike one POL from the agenda before you guys start voting on all the agenda items. Um, so thank you for the vote you took tonight. Um, seriously, this has gone on long enough and, and too much time, energy, and resources have gone into this. Um, and you guys have to kind of go back to doing what you're doing. Um, one of the things I did want to point out is that, you know, some of the things that I heard a few times, you know, if a family doesn't accept a child, all right, that does not equate to abuse, or it does not mean that child services needs to be called, all right. Um, so I would say don't jump to those kinds of conclusions, all right. Um, just from personal experience, I can guarantee you that if any point in my life, either even now or 20 years ago, all right, if I had told my parents that I was not a cis female heterosexual, all right, they would not have accepted me, all right, because of cultural and religious differences. Does that mean that they were abusive? That it was not an un that it was an unsafe home? No, it just meant they did not believe in that. All right. So I, I just don't I just want to disabuse that notion. All right. That just if a parent doesn't accept it, it means they're abusive. All right. Um, I know Howard brought it up. I want to make sure I bring it up again. Um, I will follow up with the five board members who did vote no on 3CUR on that March 4th meeting. Um, you know, just to kind of find out, you know, was there, is there something that we didn't know that you found obje objectionable about this professional development? All right. Because um, I think actions like this, it, it paints the district. All right. And you don't want people to see it. And, you know, we're, you know, I hear a lot about the teacher shortage. Guess what? When people are looking at where they're going to work next, they're going to be looking up, you know, they, they do that with companies. You look up the, the company, people are going to be looking up the district. This is what they're seeing. All right. And they may not want to be working here. All right. In a place that doesn't value, you know, providing them professional development that doesn't value inclusivity. All right. Um, I have 15 seconds left. I just want to point out that, you know, we were told that only the objectionable lines were removed from the policy. But the first line was removed. And that said, the Board of Education is committed to providing a safe, supportive and inclusive learning environment for all students. That's something we should strive for, not strike. Thank you. <laughs> M. Philippin, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, hello again. Um, Michelle Philippin, 2298 Lemoyne Avenue. Um, so first, I just wanted to say thank you to those six of you who stepped up to make the right decision tonight. Um, I know you all must be exhausted. Um, and when I've spoken the last two times, I have mostly spoken about being a teacher, but of course, I am also a parent. Um, and I wanted to contribute tonight that I also believe in parents' parents rights, but please don't put quotes around those words. I do not mean it the way that moms for liberty means it, which by the way, feel a big no thank you to having a designated extremist group feeling compelled to speak on behalf of our town tonight. I know that there was a big call out to them in Bergen County. Um, no thanks. Um, so I really feel there's just no place for that in our town. Um, and for those of you who feel like this is a stay out of my home or stay out of my family's business kind of issue, I feel pretty strongly that I have some great homeschool curricula that I can refer you to <laughs> is public education. And every kid is exactly our business. That's what the business of school is. It's that every kid is our business. Um, we're in a community. So I believe in parents' rights insofar as that I have the right 
as a parent to build a relationship with my kid. I have a right to that relationship. I have a right to make my home a safe haven and to keep them well fed and as healthy as we can manage. I don't know if you have toddlers, but it's tricky. Uh, and to be in dialogue with their school and as a partner in their education. As a teacher, I welcome that partnership. And as a parent, I engage deeply in that partnership. And I will tell you that no one and nothing, including 5756, or least of all 5756, is preventing me from engaging in that partnership with my child's school. My kid is five. And technically he'll be five and three quarters in just a few days and he won't let us forget it. Um, he is an absolute magical creature and he has been wearing dresses since just before turning four and wanting his nails painted since he was three. In one of my favorite pictures of him, he's in a police officer's cap and a giant glittery red tutu. And he thinks he may be a little bit of both a boy and a girl. They're his words, not mine. And this may mean something or absolutely nothing about who he becomes. But the point is that it is my responsibility to create a home where his dreams can be made whatever they are. That's my job. Those are Jamie, Jamie Zug. You've been promoted to panelists. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Jamie Zug. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jamie Zug. I'm, I'm gonna take this out because I'm hearing an echo of myself. I'm an, uh, I'm an attorney. I'm from Bordentown, New Jersey. My pronouns are he, him. I'm also a transgender person. Uh, I wanted to, stay on so that I could offer the board a perhaps a different framework for thinking about these issues, a, a non-political framework. Um, and that is just uh, more of a practical approach. This very issue that we're talking about a lot tonight, whether a child should be able to come out when and how they want to, is being litigated in four cases in the that are pending in the appellate division right now. And there are parallel components of those cases being litigated in the Office of Administrative Law. So if this board decides to regroup um, and to take action in which they prevent children from being able to come out when and how they would like to, I think it's very likely that that too would be litigated. There have been a lot of school districts where the school boards have decided that irrespective of whether there's gonna be litigation, they care enough about the issues that they're going to vote um, to amend policy 5756 anyway. The thing that would make your school district different is that you are coming to it so much later that your, your litigation wouldn't actually matter. This issue is gonna be decided ahead of you. So as a practical matter, this conversation, we're all showing up here because we care about it. But this conversation isn't going to make a contribution to this issue. It's being decided in the court ahead of this school district. So I think those of you who have constituents who are very concerned about this issue and you're worried about how to talk to them about it, um, you're worried about, well, you know, how am I going to talk to these parents that are concerned? You can tell them that you're not going to do something that's not meaningful for your school district, that you're going to focus your attention on something that is meaningful for your school district. This doesn't have to be political um, stepping away from amending policy 5756. This, as the court case progresses, we'll see how it turns out. And then that's gonna be an opportunity for the school district to reflect on what it wants to do next. But I just don't want anybody to feel like there need to be big lose, big winners and big losers here. This is, this is emotionally really hard meeting I don't know if you feel it, I do. This is hard, really, really hard. We don't have to be here. We don't have to keep doing it. There are other school districts. Their taxpayers are paying for it already. You don't have to. You can focus on the other things. Um, all of these arguments are already being made. So I just want to offer you that, that it doesn't have to be about this versus that or winners and losers tonight. 
we can all go home, put this behind us, watch it play out in the courts. Um, thank you so much. Candice Ramba, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Candice Ramba. Coming. We can hear you. She could hear me? Oh, thanks, Jason. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, President Victor, first of all, for handling this meeting so well. And I just want to say a few quick things that um, I thank the board for their vote tonight, but everyone's entitled to their opinion. And uh, they have to realize that both sides, whichever way the vote went last time or this time, that there's been bullying and threatening on both sides. And I just respect that everybody that came up on either side and spoke with dignity and respect to everybody in the audience. And I especially respect the children that got up and spoke on behalf of themselves and friends, because I know it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, I just had one question. Mm -hmm. I guess the gentleman that just spoke, the attorney that just spoke, I had a rhetorical question that I felt is that I don't know why all of a sudden this became, it's been in effect in our district for years. And we haven't had any issues with it. And these past few months, all of a sudden became such a big issue for us. It's a rhetorical question. I know I won't get an answer for that, but I just had to bring that up. It's been in effect. We've had teachers in here for the district for years and said it's never been brought up. We've never had any issues with it, but just something to think about. And again, I just want to thank the board members that voted. And again, uh, President Richter for her dedication to being here tonight also with um, very important things going on at our home. And we respect you for your dedication. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Eldrick, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Eldrick. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone and esteemed members of the board. I sit in my car before you today, not just as a product of the Fortley School System, but a testament to its unwavering dedication to nurturing and protecting every child under its care. Hi, my name is Eldrick Etra, I'm 2100 Linwood Avenue. As a young boy growing up in Fort Lee, I faced the harsh realities of being different. I was gay and the cruelty of my peers weighed heavily on my shoulders. But in the midst of darkness, I found light in the familiar faces of my teachers, particularly my mother, who taught me not just in the classroom, but in life. In seventh grade, when the taunts and jeers became too much to bear, it was my math teacher, Miss Murphy, who became my sanctuary. Every day, she welcomed me with open arms, offering not just a safe space, but genuine compassion and understanding. Our lunchtime conversations became a lifeline, grounding me in a world that often seemed hostile and unwelcoming. Thanks to the unwavering support of educators like Miss Murphy, I found the strength to embrace my identity and pursue my dreams. Their love and acceptance saved me from despair and sent me on a path of self-discovery and empowerment. Today, I sit in my car before you, an after-school educator in Fort Lee, and I am a living testament to the transformative power of a nurturing and inclusive environment. My journey is a testament to the values that define Fort Lee's educational community, compassion, empathy, and acceptance. As we chart the course for the future of Fort Lee schools, let us remember the impact we have on the lives of our students. Let us vow to keep Fort Lee a beacon of safety and love just as it was for me and it continues to be for me as an educator. Thank you for allowing me to share my story with you all. Margarita the Gardner, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Margarita the Gardner. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I just want to talk about a general tendency that I don't like regarding what is happening during the meeting and regarding the pressure that being put on the board members if the vote or decision of the board is not what people want to see. If you don't like, I don't even talk only about this 56, 57 policy. Now we see pressure on the board for some kind of what about the policy that we don't even know, you know, it's called diversity or inclusion, but you know, 
We don't know anything about it. And if the board members felt that it's something, you know, that is not for the, uh, for the not in the interest of current importance for the children, that's their right. It looks like, you know, I left Russia 30 years ago and I, I really couldn't believe that I will find myself in a situation when people are scared for their, you know, children being treated differently schooled. People are scared for their work if they say something during the Board of Education meeting or if they vote differently. Based on what Paula revealed, I'm not even sure that board members who flipped their voice uh, running on different platform did it voluntarily. I'm scared maybe they are not because the, the, there was an option even not to repeal completely the policy. Casey suggested a discussion. I don't know if you even read the policy. The policy said even for, you know, for psychological very significant issue, really critical cases of mental issues, the district may communicate with, not must, may communicate. So people who tell me to read the policy, you read the policy. There are several things that need to be, that need to be corrected. So you who, who actually took votes of thousands of people you did not even give a chance to discuss some small, you know, changes so the community can come together. That's very suspicious. Yeah. That reminds me of communist Russia. Talking yeah. about extremist organization, we have some kind of new form communist party of Fort Lee, and they have a method. If they don't like something, they would paint you extremist. They would paint you, you know, far right they are being far left okay and i believe far right and far left meeting exactly at the same point okay board members remember not all pair i'm not talking this is a very sensitive issue i can understand that but overall you have to remember parents not most of the parents don't talk they silently voted for you okay they silently voted for you you took their votes and now you're flipping. You had to give a chance for the discussion. You had to give a chance for the discussion. Shame on you. Christina Amendolia, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Christina Amendolia. Hi, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Amendolia. I live at 2175 Hudson Terrace. I've been a Fort Lee resident for nearly 20 years, and I have a child in intermediate school. The place we're starting from is one we actually have in common. We love our kids. Me, everyone who's there tonight attending this meeting, everyone on the school board who has children, we love our kids, and we want what's best for them. We want them to be happy and fulfilled. We want them to be safe. But actually, the kids are all right. We're the ones with the problem. As parents, I think it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that our kids are human beings because they're smaller than we are. But they have their own minds and their own bodies and they have their own hearts. We raise our children, we share our knowledge, we instill them with our values but we must also trust them and trust ourselves that we laid a good foundation. My child came out as non-binary and changed their pronouns to they, them about a year and a half ago, except I could have told you when they were two and a half, three years old, but I didn't impose my observations on them. I didn't introduce the concept or the language. It came from them. It came from their heart and they told me, and what did I do? Nothing. I listened. I held space for them. And when they told their teachers, the staff, the administration at their school, what did those folks do? Nothing. Except see them, accept them, and hold space for them. And most importantly, keep them safe. 
We all know the indoctrination is not happening in our schools. The teacher, staff, and administration they are too busy. They don't have time. Their plates are overflowing with the actual business of running the schools, of educating our kids, and of keeping everyone safe, happy, and healthy. They don't have any agenda. They're not trying to drive a wedge between kids and their parents. We parents can do a very good job of driving that wedge ourselves if we choose to. And to suggest that the people in our schools are doing so is insulting and demeans the excellent work that they do every day. Because if we thought otherwise, we wouldn't put our kids in the schools. If we thought otherwise, we wouldn't live in Fort Lee. The push to repeal policy 5756 by some of you is ill-conceived and the proposal to amend it is downright foolhardy. The current policy has been in place for five years and it is working. My child is a perfect, perfect example of that. If you take, for example, another child I know who was trans, came out to their friends, came out to the teachers, didn't come out to their parents right away for no in particular reason, they just weren't comfortable. But if you go to the other end of the spectrum, the child who cannot tell their parents because it is unsafe to do so, you are directly putting that child in harm's way if you continue this path of repealing and even replacing this policy. Let's put this behind us now. Thank you for your vote tonight. Thank you for your time. Michelle Perez, you have been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hi. It's almost 11 o'clock. Is anybody tired? <laughs> Great. I, I had so much to say, but I don't have to anymore. Thank you for voting appropriately. I'm really proud of all of you. Um, I'm proud of you for saying what you think. Uh, even if I don't agree with you, I am proud of you for your time. Not that you need me to be proud of you because you can be proud of yourselves. Um, I just want to have a couple of things and I will hopefully finish well before three minutes. Um, in New Jersey, civil rights start at the time of birth, not in fifth grade. A parent's constitutional rights are not infringed upon in 5756, according to the court's decision in the Hanover decision. If you read it, you would know that. And I know a bunch of you have, and I'm sure you'll come at me and yell at me that I'm wrong, but I know I'm right because I read it. Also, a parent is not kept from finding out information. These are all fallacies that just keep getting repeated and repeated and repeated. Just because something gets repeated doesn't make it correct. Little details like may or must have serious legal implications in a policy. They are not small words. Be careful what you change. So let's see what the courts say. I'm sure you have plenty of curriculum and building and grounds issues to discuss at your next meeting. Thank you to our teachers, our administrators. Thank you to the board for your time. Thank you, Jason Ruggiero, for your hours of patience. And <laughs> We appreciate all of you, and thank you for maintaining that the Board of Education is committed to providing a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment for all of our students. Thank you. There are no more raised hands. Ms. Curry. Yes, I have stayed for my name on 3 Mr. Knight. Yes, I'm standing on my name. Okay. Mrs. Cotang. Yes, I'm staying my name on 3 Mr. Lopez. Yes, I'm staying on 3B, my name. Ms. Morrell. Yes, I have stayed on my name on 3B. Mr. Rubino? Yes. 
This is Rick there. Yes, abstaining from my name on 3B. May I have a motion to approve items 1 CUR through 3 CUR? Oh, good. Second. Motion morale, second. Byers Kang, roll call, please. This is Byers Kang. Yes. This is Colback. Yes. This is Curry. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mrs. Kotang. Yes. Mr. Lopez. Yes. Ms. Morrell. Yes. Mr. Rubino. Yes. Mrs. Richter. Yes. I have a motion to approve items 1F through 14F. Motion. Second. Second. Motion by Byers Kang. Second. <clears throat> call, call, please. Mrs. Byers Kang. Yes. Ms. Colbat. Yes, and a big thank you to ACME and the Portley Chamber of Commerce who donated over $5,000 to the district. Mrs. Curry. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mrs. Cotang. Yes. Mr. Lopez. Yes. Ms. Morrell. Yes. Mr. Rubino. Yes. Mrs. Richter. Yes. May I have a motion to approve items 1P through 12P? Motion. Second. Motion Morrell, second. And roll call, please. Mrs. Byers Kang. Yes. Ms. Colbach. Yes. Mrs. Curry. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mrs. Cotang. Yes. Mr. Lopez. Yes. Ms. Morrell. Yes. Mr. Rubino. Yes. Mrs. Richter. Yes. May I have a motion to approve item one PLO? You can move this the way it's stated and just vote no, or you can move to withdraw it in order to take it from the agenda. Either I make a move, I make a motion to withdraw it from the agenda. Ms. Morrell has made a motion to withdraw item one PLL from the agenda, and Ms. Kotang has seconded that. Vote. Sorry? Yeah, I oppose. Okay. Um, we have to take roll call. This is Byers Kang. Yes. This is Colback. No. This is Curry. Yes. Mr. Knight. Okay. So, so for uh, for one POL, I vote yes on policy 33. So the vote is to withdraw. The vote is to withdraw. Oh, then I vote no. Mrs. Cotang? Yes. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Ms. Morrell? Yes. Mr. Rubino? Yes. Mrs. Richter? Yes. Okay, is there any old business? Any new business? Motion to adjourn? Wait, well, oh, I, just, sorry. I just want to address the three CUR that people okay. keep inquiring about. Um, so there had been some discussion since that was a contract in, in, in private. Um, and so I voted no on that because I asked a number of questions and the answers weren't readily available. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with the information that I got. So I, I voted no on it. it. It keeps coming up. So I just wanted to explain my personal vote. Thank you. A motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion, motion morale, second. Pull back. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Thank you. Good night. Good night.